As a town board trustee, you are responsible for oversight of the town's budget and its employees. What steps will you take to provide more accountability and oversight of town's employees? Well, in regard to that, our, our budget has been favorable the last four years in pretty much every category. Uh, we've received favorable audits from two different auditing companies, one out of Alamosa, one out of Denver. And um, I understand that there's some concern about transparency because we don't have a website and we don't post the budget. But we have meetings every month, second Thursday of every month. Uh, and once the budget is approved, uh, anybody's willing to come and request our monthly financials. So we receive, for example, now in uh, March, we will receive March financials, but February financials will be able to be looked at by whoever requests them. We do have a town policy, which was not established by this board, where you have to make the request in writing, which is within the purview of the law. You know, you just have to file the Colorado Open Records Act request to receive any public documents you want. Um, I realize that there are some issues that people don't necessarily appreciate that, but that was not instituted by this board. We're just following a policy which is already in place. And nobody's really raised us, uh, raised the concern about changing it, but I have no issue with changing it. If that's a, if it's put as an action item, we'll vote on it. I, I have nothing to hide whatsoever, and if people want to see our records, uh, they're welcome to see them. Um, We've had an influx of uh, at least $128,000 in the 22 months that we've been collecting money from the recreational marijuana sales. And that's helped the town greatly, and that's all in our audit, it's all in our budget. Uh, and that does not include the local sales tax. On local sales tax, we only get one check for all the businesses. So it's not delineated between this business gave us this much and this business gave us this much. It's just one check from the state. Uh, but I would estimate that we've received upwards of $200,000, $225,000 total in the 22 months that we've been receiving. And all that's in the budget, and I have no problem with people seeing that. Uh, if and when uh, we get a webmaster, uh, we'll post everything. I, I personally do not have the uh, skill set to run a website. And that's one of the reasons that I haven't taken that bull by the horns, and nor have any of the board members for for various reasons. I can't speak for them, though. Um, I hope that answers the question. It does. Um, I don't necessarily understand question two. I'm going to read it as stated. I, myself, am most concerned about residency issues and how to challenge them per the standing town board. It's all overseen by one and only one person, so our requests were brought to public comments. But as most often happens, still no answers. It may be disputed directly through the state, but who knows? But one and only one town employee, LOL, same stuff, different issues. Great idea. I hope all candidates participate. And if the school wants, I will take a group, a young adults, as a journalism or history lesson. So that's uh, verbatim. And that was uh, posted publicly on the Facebook page by the liquor store employee, no? Okay. So Yeah. Um, any residency issues can be challenged. Uh, like everything else, I mean, there's paperwork involved. And to my knowledge, I can't speak directly, but nobody has filed uh, a request for uh, challenging anybody's residency issues. Uh, you come in, you say, I don't believe this person lives in town. You file a complaint through the town clerk, and she, in this case it's she, she will investigate it. And uh, it's right, it, it only goes to the town clerk. But if she does find irregularities, then it might come to the board. Um, I know that when uh, we all did our petitions to run for office, uh, four of my 20-some signatures were invalid because she checked residency issues and they were invalid signatures. And so I know that she has the purview to do that, and I know she has done that probably with every candidate, and she invalidated several signatures on every uh, petition. So uh, I think touching base on this question specifically, that there's a candidate um, that I know on which side that's yeah, and um, I've, I've heard that there's one from each side. But again, that's not something I would investigate myself. But um, I think that there's one, one candidate that uh, works in Alamosa and has a residence in Alamosa, uh, and, but also maintains a residence here. And per our statutes, that makes him a resident. And on the other side of the coin, there's a candidate that maintains a residence here in town and in one of the villages uh, outside of town, uh, but has lived in town 
for the requisite number of months and pays bills in town and has a mailing address here. And to my knowledge, that makes that person a resident as well. But I don't have the uh, legal expertise to comment on that further other than it's been looked into and I believe that it's, uh, per our statutes, they're both residents. Because they main rate, maintain two residents doesn't disqualify them as residents of a particular municipality, ours in particular. Number three, excise tax on marijuana. How do you, the candidate, sit on the issue when Amendment 64 passed and the town voted in? The previous town board had discussed implementation of an excise tax. This is the same as the other communities who approve legal sales. Somehow this item was dropped and our town has missed out on a significant amount of revenue. Um, do you want me to do three and four together since they're part of a multi-part question? Yeah. So here's number four. Uh, talk is that people in the county are trying to get a ballot initiative to have a county sales tax on marijuana. Being that it wasn't quote unquote good enough for them to have in the county or in other towns in the county as town board members, would they support the addition of a county imposed sales tax on marijuana sold in Antonito? If you're opposed to question three or four, please explain why and what you would do to fight it. Um, I am not opposed to an excise tax. The issue that was conveyed to us as a board through our attorney and through uh, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is Tabor Amendment, if, if you're more familiar with it by that name, is that the state would not collect the excise tax for us. So we would have to hire somebody to collect that excise tax. And it would be on wholesales. Uh, the grows in particular, the tamale factory, and the hemp uh, growing facility are the five that were brought up. The three grows, the tamales, and the hemp growing. Does this need to be a, a Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment certified marijuana person, or is it just an agricultural? No, we, we could hire somebody of, of our own uh, volition to, to collect it. The point that was brought up to us is, because we've only been collecting for 22, 23 months now. Um, and the grows are even younger than that, right? The recreational is 22 months old. The grows are more like a year, 16 months old, something like that. Um, and there are, to my knowledge, two grows that are doing well at the moment. And once they are well established and it would be fiscally responsible to hire a person to collect the excise tax, we should do it uh, because right now we would be losing money on the person's salary. We wouldn't be collecting enough excise tax to uh, pay the person's salary because there's not enough grow happening yet. However, once all the grows are up and running, I think there would be plenty of uh, incentive for the town to collect that excise tax. Uh, to the other question, uh, I... Uh, I don't know anything about what the commissioners are planning to do. Uh, I know that the uh, sales tax has been very good to Antonito. I already alluded to the uh, approximate figures earlier. I know for a fact we've collected 128 from the state. Sales tax is differing because, like I said, it's one check. Um, but um, my principal concern is with the town of Antonito and its outlying communities while they're our neighbors, and I respect them, and I have every uh, intention of supporting, especially the ones that are affiliated in satellites of Antonito, my one concern is that Antonito grow and prosper to the best of its ability. And if, uh, if I felt that the county sales tax would hurt Antonito, I would oppose it. Uh, so regarding cannabis in Antonito, do you feel taxes on cannabis products, including hemp, should be raised or lowered? Uh, again, this goes to the issue of collection, because the state collects the taxes for us, so that makes it easier for us not having to hire an extra person to collect it. So if we raise it, we'd have to hire somebody to collect the extra. Number six, regarding cannabis and Antonito, do you feel it has had a benefit or has had a negative impact on the town? In what manner? Um, in terms of crime, we haven't seen any uh, additional uh, crime spikes or anything like that. I think more pertinent to the crime wave in Antonito has been the opiate crisis, which is not unique to Antonito. It's a nationwide problem uh, declared so by our federal government. I think any community uh, that exists has an opiate crisis. I think it's affected every single family, uh, either directly or indirectly, probably in the entire country. I can't say that definitively, but it would seem almost as such. Um, in terms of uh, benefiting the town, well, I've already alluded to the sales tax. Uh, ridership on the train went up a 
about 4,000. I have actual numbers, I just don't have them in front of me. Ridership on the train went up about 4,000 riders last year in Antonito. Uh, it could be 2,000, but anyway, it did go up significantly compared to previous years. Um, in terms of our overall sales tax and bottom line, not just from uh, recreational, uh, those have gone up. They've afforded us the ability, uh, no pun intended, to purchase the mansion, to buy a new front end loader, to uh, buy a track hoe for the community, uh, to get used police vehicles, but new to us, to get new fleet vehicles, to buy a new trash truck. All of that has been the result of more people coming in, more ridership, more sales tax, and more revenue coming into the community. Mr. Aveda, um, with the, the candidates who chose not to be interviewed by audio or video, mm -hmm. we're not able to ask follow-up questions because we're not going to receive yeah. their replies until we post them. As you're replying right now, we do have one question that was asked along those lines about people coming into the community. Um, there was mention that a town board uh, member has family who was serving on the town board at the time who said that someone didn't belong here due to the color of their skin. Are you familiar with any racially charged issues within the, the town board or previous town boards? Or current Somebody on the town board, board said that? To a citizen of, of uh, Nat Nat Again, this is hearsay from the actual citizen who it was said to. Um, I know there was... Um, there's been some contentious moments on the board and, you know, disagreements. But if it was somebody on the town board saying that somebody else on the town board didn't belong because of their skin color, that's not happened. Uh, there has been some allusions to uh, people in the audience, you know, not understanding the community, not being from the community, but race was never mentioned as, a, as part of it, nor was gender, nor was sexuality, nor was age. It was more a matter of, uh, you know, this is a community of long-standing residents and citizens that know each other, which is sometimes to our detriment. Uh, and there are people that you know, come in and presume to know things. And those types of arguments and or exchanges did happen, but there was nothing about race to my recollection. And I, I personally would not tolerate that. Anybody that's ever had me in a class knows that I believe in a safe environment, whether it's a town board meeting, whether it's a classroom, whether it's a department meeting. And anything that challenges people's differences is not something that I would ever stand for on any level. I, I just would not tolerate that. Uh, now, in terms of outsiders, that was brought up and there was some back and forth about that. But race, gender, sexuality, ageism, none of that entered into the equation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, what number are we on? Uh, I believe seven. Uh, do you feel the numerous cannabis shops in town limits, a dab lounge, a cannabis-friendly hotel, increased tourism to Antonito? If yes, do you feel they, they, are, they are bring, and this is verbatim, they are bring in tourists who assist or burden the town, and why? Um, I don't see tourists as, as a burden. I see them as uh, people that choose to come and visit a very unique and beautiful community, people that come here because they have a reason to be here, whether it's the train, whether it's the mountains, whether it's fishing. So I don't see the tourists as a burden. Um, there are three recreational shops. Uh, this is all anecdotal, but I understand that about 80 to 85 percent of the people that uh, frequent the shops are not local. And of those 85 percent, about 75 percent are from New Mexico. Uh, I've not verified that independently. I've just heard that through uh, various channels. So in that regard, I think people do come in, and whether it's the recreational, they stop and they eat, uh, they may buy stuff at the store, they may come to the local hotels and motels. Uh, for all I know, uh, they may decide to come back and make a, a week of it, or two weeks of it. Um, and uh, I don't see that as a detriment to our community. Um, so no, I don't see that as a, as a bad thing. Uh, number eight. Uh, Many residents may not know who you are. Can you please explain your history in Antonito? And if you're from elsewhere, what, what brought you to Antonito? I am a lifelong resident. I went away to go to college, but I am the seventh of nine generations. My name is Aaron Abeda, in case you haven't figured that already. Um, and um, I, I love my hometown. Uh, I'm an author, I'm a poet, I'm a writer. And uh, everything I write, everything I do in my adult life has been dedicated to my community. 
and win or lose this election, that's not going to change. I, I love my hometown. I love its people, and I love everything about it. I realize there's things that need changing. I realize that there are obstacles to any community, not just Antonito. But it's my love of community that I think makes me uh, most suited to helping people as opposed to hindering their growth. And I, uh, I've lived here my whole life. I, I know the community very well. Um, and, you know, God willing, I will be buried here. That's, uh, I intend to raise my daughter here. I intend to see my life flourish here in Antonito and surrounding communities. Um, what experience do you have that can benefit Antonito and how do you plan on achieving these goals if obstacles from other town board members are in opposition? Well, the town board, uh, I think opposition is good. I think the dissent is good. I think our country is founded on dissent. I think that any uh, difference of opinion, unfortunately, has led to long-standing rifts between community members and families, and I wish it weren't so. Uh, I refuse to be a source of that division. I, I would hope that I'm able to reconcile and reunite as, as a leader, whether it's a mayor, whether it's working for the church in a volunteer capacity, in any capacity that I approach my hometown and its residents, I hope to be a person that reconciles. So to me, obstacles are opportunities to hear difference of opinion, and those difference of opinions can often be incorporated and synthesized into a better solution. That's important. We can't just be always at each other's throats and because we disagree, never speak to one another again. I, I, I firmly believe in opposition. I believe in dissent because I think it's a very healthy uh, model for growth, so long as people can synthesize their differences into a better working solution. Um, if you choose not to be interviewed on video, phone, or via audio in person, can you explain your choice? Well, that's uh, uh, obviously not pertinent to this because I am on video and audio. Um, this next question is a little hard to read because of the printer, but I'll do my best. If elected, will you allow Antonito News or any other entity to live stream town board meetings to the internet or record meetings to video for uploading publicly at a later time? This question has been asked numerous times and by multiple residents. Transparency, transparency excuse me, is an issue of great concern. Uh, that's a board decision. I personally have no issue with that. Uh, I think they should be live streamed. If, uh, if I had the acumen to run a website, I, I would volunteer. Uh, we had a previous board member that had our website up and running, and uh, when he chose not to run for re-election, uh, it fell by the wayside, and then he was appointed later on, and uh, I think he was maybe a year is what he was appointed for, and the website just never got updated. But yeah, live stream, uh, getting a new website, uh, it hasn't been my priority, I will be honest, because of the Main Street project, because of the water project, because of the fines through Colorado Department of Health and Environment. And just it was just a matter of triage and what was most pertinent to the community at the moment. And those were big, multi-million dollar projects that needed my attention. But yeah, if there's a board member that wants to take that as their personal charge, I would, I would welcome that. And if somebody wants to film, by all means, do it, as long as the board is... Uh, willing to vote on that, I think that's a good thing. Okay. What do you feel are the positive qualities about the town of Antonito and its citizens? I believe that we have so many positive qualities. Uh, chief among them is our sense of community, uh, which sometimes gets challenged. I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but we are by nature and by history and by culture a communal uh, place. And Despite divisions, we tend to help one another. We tend to look after one another. We tend to have solidarity in our shared love of place. I think sometimes we disagree on how to love a place. And those differences are detrimental to us. I will admit that. But our, our sense of community, I think, is our strongest attribute. Our, our willingness to uh, defend one another, look after one another, take care of one another when times are really, really hard. And uh, we see that. Uh, over and over again, we're reminded of our of our uh, interwovenness often. 
but we're also sometimes divided, and I would hope to reconcile that as best I can. Um, other strengths, like as, as our language, our heritage, our multiple uh, faiths that exist here in the community, um, just our, our willingness to see our children live in a better place. I think we all have that in common. Uh, they, they represent a hope for our community. And um, so our youth, our faith, our community, our communal uh, history, our language, all those are strengths, which I would hope to nurture and bolster. Uh, like I said, may or not, those are my, my charges in life to make my community better. I would hope to be able to do it as mayor. Um, what do you feel are negative qualities occurring within the town of Antonito? How do you plan on addressing these if elected? Um, again, there's several, but I think the most uh, detrimental to our community right now is the opiate crisis and the way it's affected families. Uh, it's killed people. It's broken homes. It's broken families. And uh, it's not unique to Antonito, as I said earlier. It's a national problem. Uh, early in my uh, tenure as mayor, we tried to have a, not a rehab facility here in Antonito, but a place where people could go for counseling. And I, I worked with mental health briefly on that initiative, and that got sidetracked for various reasons. Uh, I think it would probably go beyond that. I think that's a step for somebody that's already in recovery. Um, I think what really needs to happen is that with a more vibrant economy, with more uh, opportunities for jobs coming in, hopefully that sense of despair that leads to drug addiction in the first place might be alleviated in some way. And because it's alleviated, then people could find dignity in work, right? So we have two gas stations coming into Antonito. Here within the next two months, we'll have one up and running. The other one, hopefully by winter. Uh, one of them is a truck stop. One of them is more conducive to just uh, you know regular commuter vehicles. But we foresee those two gas stations possibly you know maybe ten new jobs, right? If these grows get up and running to the capacity that they're capable of, one of them, two of them, all three of them, that's more jobs. And for those that don't know, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. There, there are three uh, cannabis grows and one hemp grow, although the hemp grow is, uh, full disclosure, it's my dad and my brother. Uh, I have no personal involvement other than the, my dad and my brother that run it. Um, but most of their grow is east of town, uh, open air under the sprinkler. Uh, they do bring product in and dry, and they do have uh, a couple of rooms where they start the plants, and then they transfer them out to the fields. They transplant them. Anyway, back to the question. There are three grows. To my knowledge, there are two which are up and running. And um, I don't know the numbers of their employees, but I think that there are already probably 10 employees that work for both those grows minimum. There may be more. I've not asked either of the two uh, license holders. Um, but the gas stations, uh, the hometown seems to be growing, it would appear, just by the number of people in their lot. All those things are new Main Street. All these things are bringing, I hope, uh, more jobs to our community and with hope, with that uh, sense of work and dignity, then maybe that sense of despair goes away and the opiate crisis isn't as uh, prevalent as it, as it has been. Uh, we need to do something about it. Uh, in terms of law enforcement and the opiate crisis, uh, I'm not allowed to mention names because I'm an elected official, but uh, we've made numerous arrests, dozens of arrests. And it's frustrating not only to the law enforcement under my purview, but it's frustrating to community members, too, where those arrests are made. And within a week, those very same people are out on the street again. Uh, there are three facets to law enforcement. There's obviously the police force, there's the district attorney, and there's the judicial system. I'm not throwing either the DA nor the judicial system under the bus. I'm just saying the three need to be in concert more effectively uh, to get the drug problem under control. And uh, how that's going to happen if, um, again, it, it takes an entire board, it takes an entire community. And if there's a particular board member that wants to take up that charge, they should. I encourage that. Would I help? Absolutely. You bet. So again, just a follow-up question since we have you in, in person. Um, yeah. The two town gas stations that you mentioned, is one going to be the farm road or is that going to be... No, ROG is currently pumping. 
they use uh, debit cards. Uh, I don't know exactly about his convenience store or his retail side of things uh, when that will be up and running, but he's now pumping gas. The other and the other one is going to be Hometown Market. Uh, Mr. Sowards is going to put in a station with, I believe, three pumps, diesel and uh, gasoline. That's the one for just regular commuter vehicles. And then Mr. Fred Cordova uh, and his family are putting one uh, south of town, just a little bit south of the narrow gauge uh, railroad and motel on that property. And that one's going to be conducive not only to commuter vehicles, but larger vehicles such as semis. And uh, that uh, he's in the stage of, uh, he's got an architect, he's got the plan, he's working with CDOT, uh, the town board, myself in particular, are helping him with access from Highway 285 so he can get into the property. We're helping him annex into the town so we can benefit from uh, uh, sales tax, but also so that we can maintain the roads that are being used to access his uh, property and his business. So in by June, we'll have two gas stations pumping, maybe two with also retail uh, aspects affiliated with them, and hopefully by winter, we'll have three gas stations pumping, all with retail affiliated with them. All right, moving along. Um, many residents are unhappy about some unsightly yards and lots within town overflowing with weeds, junk, or both. How do you plan to address this issue? If there is a current municipal code, how could this better be? In, how could this be better enforced? Excuse me on that. Um, we have recently posted for a code officer. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the election on Tuesday. I hope that regardless of who gets elected. Uh, on Tuesday that they review the applications and we hire a code enforcement officer with the sole purpose of enforcing our municipal code which has codes for weeds, has codes for yards, has codes for all these uh, different unsightly overflowing uh, lots and yards as worded in the question. Uh, there's no doubt that those yards exist. Uh, again, it's not just a town board responsibility, it's an individual responsibility, it's a, a property holder's responsibility. But um, we would hope to maybe nudge at first so it's not punitive to the owner of the lot and or residents. But if they don't comply, then we have the code enforcement officer who would enforce the code. In that same vein, the code enforcement officer would also be in charge of uh, monitoring the stray dogs in town. And for the longest time, uh, everybody knows her as Anna, the dog lady, right? Uh, she ran spay and neuter clinics. She uh, got an affiliation with the town through the no-kill shelter in Costilla County, and we took numerous animals to that no-kill shelter to try and uh, mitigate the stray dog problem here in Antonito. Uh, but with her moving away, uh, that's fallen, uh, unfortunately, by the wayside, uh, and law enforcement doesn't have the vehicles to transport dogs because if they arrest somebody who's allergic to an animal, that leaves us liable in that regard. So they can't haul dogs in their cruisers and then arrest somebody who's potentially allergic to a cat or a dog or whatever the animal might be. Uh, so that's difficult for us without Anna's help. Uh, but the code enforcement officer would be able to use one of the fleet vehicles that the community has re recently purchased to transport to the no-kill shelter, which we contribute to yearly. Does the town work the narrow gauge railroad in? Her and Anna uh, were uh, working together, and I can't speak to that relationship. I don't know if they still work together or haven't, but uh, I have not been approached by anyone other than Anna for the dog problem and uh, seeing how we might mitigate that problem. Have you reached out to other candidates you're running against during campaigning? Do you feel you have been able to work with other candidates during this election smoothly and without incident? As I said earlier in the interview, I do not want to be a source of division, but in all uh, fairness, I have not reached out to anybody uh, directly. I've seen a few of them in the community, and I've spoken to them, you know, hello, how are you type things. Uh, I have no malice towards anyone. Uh, if they have malice towards me, I can't help that. Uh, I, I and I mean that sincerely, I have no malice towards anyone. If, uh, if I can be Christian, if I can help people, if I can be kind, that's always going to be my default, every single time. And uh, I, I believe I can work with anyone. Uh, and as I stated earlier, 
I have no problem whatsoever with dissent or disagreement. I think those are healthy, not divisive. And I, will, I refuse to be a source of divisiveness. Uh, I, I would like to be a, uh, somebody who leads by example. And if, if I've been divisive towards somebody in the past, I would ask them to forgive me and take me at my word. I'm sincere in this. That uh, That's not who I am anymore. I mean, I, I've never been that person to my recollection, but I... I I'm done with that. If, if I ever was that, I'm not that anymore. I, I'm always going to use kindness and human dignity and respect as my default. Um, but no, they have not reached out to me nor have I to them other than seeing them in passing. And for the most part, it's been friendly, cordial at least. Um, concerns exist about the War Shower Mansion and its condition, materials, cost for repair, and use of the grounds as storage for heavy equipment, trash trucks, or other large items. If elected, speaking of the exterior only, what do you imagine or hope the property and land to look like, including the large cemented area west of the building? Uh, working backwards, uh, the large cemented area west of the building used to be a shed. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but it used to be a shed where Mr. Robbins used to work on small engines. Uh, small, uh, he was a mechanic, right? And that was part of his shop. As such, that entire block is uh, zoned uh, commercial and surrounded by residential. Um, we've moved all but one uh, trash truck from the premises. Uh, we've had trouble, uh, possibly because of the earlier opiate crisis, which I alluded to, where our vehicles are being broken into, our batteries are being stolen. Uh, so we parked them temporarily at the Warshower Mansion while it's being uh, renovated uh, into Town Hall so that we can keep them on under camera so we can watch them. Uh, I anticipate that we're going to move all our industrial equipment out to the uh, to the lagoons, to our wastewater facility, which is fenced and uh, locked, and therefore probably a little more of a deterrent to anybody that want to you know steal batteries or break into vehicles or whatever. The town administrator had mentioned to, to us when we took photos of the Warshara Mansion um, shortly after the purchase was announced uh, that the cameras were going to be installed in the security system. Um, has that been done already? No, they're on his house. So his, he's right across the street, so he's monitoring from his cameras at the moment. But yeah, our intent is to have cameras because uh, to the other question about what we're going to use the grounds for, uh, the current town park has been a place of granted some recreation, but mostly of ill repute. Uh, so we're going to move town park to the Warshower Mansion. We're going to use that whole city block as a community gathering place. Uh, We've removed anything that wasn't original to the structure, but we haven't touched the structure in its original form whatsoever because that would jeopardize uh, funding from historical society from grants. Oh, so there is funding. Oh, there's, there's grants available, and we are going to pursue them. Uh, that's definitely in the works. But one of the reasons we re removed the front porch, other than the fact that it was leaking, was because it wasn't original. And uh, so anything that isn't original we removed and will remove so that we can be more eligible for set grants. Plus, it just looks better. Uh, in terms of the yard, uh, we installed a sprinkler system because there's a, a commercial, not a residential well, I correct myself. There's a residential well on the property, I think it's 60 gallon per minute well, which was part of the $175,000 purchase price. So uh, we'll have a, a new lawn with a new sprinkling system. There's going to be a community garden in the uh, northwest corner. There's going to be an outdoor uh, kitchen for people that want to do barbecues, that want to do uh, outdoor classes on cooking and cultural cooking. There's going to be an ordino there. right? All that is in the works. It's going to be a place where the mansion is a place where we can come together. Um, and I, I, I know that people probably won't believe this, but I, I really am sincerely concerned with reconciliation of our community. And one of the very first places where our community became divided was at that mansion. When the war showers, uh, you know, through at least through oral tradition, uh, took people's livelihoods when they stole their lambs and the money and uh, uh, their land and all the things associated with those lambs and the livestock that the war showers stole and or took without paying the community members. The land followed. 
Then people started fleeing and the exodus of people leaving our community. That led to language loss, cultural loss. All of that, in my opinion, one of the genesis and focal areas for that division in our community is the mansion. If it can be a place of healing and reconciliation, that's what I believe is my vision for that mansion. Just really quick for personal curiosity, what's the artwork going to be? The artwork? The, it's not going to be touched unless the historical society says it can be touched. Right now, it's in pretty good shape. The main floor is, in, I would, according to our, uh, when we had it appraised, uh, for what it's worth, it appraised at two hundred and fifteen thousand, and we purchased it for one seventy-five, so forty below appraised. Uh, the main floor was said to be in good condition. Uh, the library is going to be a town uh, meeting area for town board, assuming the new town board wants it to be, right? So much may change on Tuesday. Uh, but it's also going to be a community museum. Right? We want people to know our history. We want people to know how important this place is to us. So when it's not being used as a, as a meeting facility the second Thursday of every month, we want it to be a, a museum, a cultural museum. I'd like to work in conjunction with anybody that wants to work with me. That's my goal. I want to be a person that works with other people. Uh, if we're a satellite of that museum, if we're a, an addendum to that museum, if we're independent of that museum, if we become that museum, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a blank slate at the moment in terms of the museum. But the Warshower Mansion is nothing but potential with the community garden going in, with the outdoor uh, cooking facility going in, with the town park moving there. Uh, we're going to powder coat the fence that goes around it so it's not this glaring aluminum chain link fence. Uh, we're going to do our best to restore the wrought iron fence in front as best we can uh, so that it stays as original as possible. Although there are places where it was bent and or damaged. Uh, but we're going to do our best to keep that wrought iron on the east side of the mansion intact as best we can. No, it was it was leaking very very badly. Uh, it had most of it had to be disposed of. Um, if you'd been in the mansion recently, um, that porch area had. I'm not a, an appraiser, or nor am I a carpenter, but I would say extensive water damage. And uh, not only was it leaking into the patio area, but there was some capillary action where it was coming backwards, and it was actually eroding some of the original boards and the. Uh, borders of the, of the house because of the capillary action where the water is running uphill on the, uh, on the tin of that porch. So uh, most of that lumber was rotted out. The nails were rusted. Uh, to my knowledge, and again, I didn't oversee the, them taking it down. I knew it was happening. But to my knowledge, that material was uh, disposed of. Residents have observed the removal of many portions of the mansion as well as movement of materials that came with the home and or property. One specific observation brought to our attention by a few readers is that a large stack of stone or type of decorative rock thought to have been a portion of the mansion's structure and possibly expensive was removed from the mansion grounds after purchase then relocated to a home in town where the pile is said to have gradually decreased in size and was later found elsewhere in the county. How do you plan on investigating this issue? And if found to be true and unauthorized, will you seek restitution or criminal charges? Uh, this is the first I've heard of this, um, not to play the naive card. But the only thing I can think of is when we took down the shed, earlier there was a question about the concrete pad, which used to be the shed. And adjacent to or inside that shed, we found some tiles. Uh, and they were the roof tiles. Uh, a about as big and as, as this table, give or take, maybe a little bit bigger. And uh, if you've been in the mansion recently, you know that there was some uh, leaks, not just from the porch that we removed, but from the chimneys and some of the old tiles, which are presumably from the 1920s, at least very old. Um, so I know that we used some of those extra tiles to repair the roof. And we took off the old tiles. And then those tiles, which were no longer functional, 
were removed. Uh, so it may have appeared that it was pile A and pile A was what was being removed, but pile A went to the roof and then the tiles that were removed from the roof were then put into said pile as detritus, debris. That's the only thing I can think of. Things from the town. So the second part of the question, if, if people are taking things in an unauthorized manner, for all intents and purposes, stealing, then yeah, restitution needs to be sought. If it's beyond a certain amount, then criminal charges definitely need to be brought. I'm not, a, I'm not averse to the law. We're all citizens here. We all fall under the same laws and uh, statutes. Uh, but in terms of a large pile of rock, the mansion's made out of brick. The only thing that looked like rock, to my knowledge, were those tiles, and we used much of what we found to repair what was not uh, in working order on the roof. Um, and we removed all those uh, old tiles are gone now. And uh, the adobes that were there, uh, they may be used for the Orno if uh, Cornell's Clean Water needs them, but those are gone as well. Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, this uh, has never been brought to my attention, and if it were, I'd investigate it. Um, I can't mention names, but um, because of FERPA and privacy acts, but the two instances that have been brought to my attention, uh, those employees no longer work for the town. That's all I can say about that without divulging more information, which I'm not allowed to do. But uh, that's just not something that I tolerate, nor do I think the board would. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are you going to do to enforce the existing loose dog ordinance? This has a huge effect on visitors of the narrow gauge inn who complain daily about the dogs running loose. This affects every business in town. Motorcyclists, I think they mean plural, should not have to kick dogs off them riding through. They are not stopping to spend money if they have to worry about dogs biting. I think this is begging, but if my, my copy is a little bit off. Um, I think I've talked about that already. Uh, Regardless of who gets elected on Tuesday, one of the positions we're hiring for is a code enforcement officer. And that code enforcement officer could then use our fleet vehicles to deal with the dog problem. And we have an ordinance in place, and during my tenure, for at least two and a half years, we had a very dedicated citizen that helped us enforce that policy. And if, uh, and if anybody wants to help with it, assuming they have the training and don't put themselves in any sort of peril, uh, we could give them the proper training and or uh, uniform and they could come and help us with the problem. Uh, that's, that's the way that Anna did it in the past. Uh, on a volunteer basis, but we provided her with a vehicle. We made sure that that was okay with our insurance. We, we provided her with a uniform that wasn't a law enforcement uniform, but that gave her capacity as a town volunteer slash employee. And, uh, and she did her job. And if she ran into any trouble, then she would call in law enforcement to assist. And anybody that would like to do that, at least the current board, would be amenable to that because we've done it in the past. And I agree, there's a problem with loose dogs. Absolutely. And um, we spend $1,000 a year on the no-kill shelter. That's our donation to the no-kill shelter because that's what we believe in. We don't want the animals to be uh, harmed or executed. Uh, and... Uh, just getting the dogs to them is a difficult thing. And I, I think this is on film already, but law enforcement can't do it because if somebody were allergic after we've transported a vehicle, they would be doubly liable for that person that had an allergic reaction, especially if it were a deadly one. Uh, so that's the reason we can't use law enforcement vehicles to transport uh, animals. Mm -hmm. uh, who is the town's MED cannabis officer? Uh, the minute state three licenses were issued to an officer in our community. Has this been established or if elected and it has not, will you work to establish this? Uh, we don't have a dedicated cannabis officer. Uh, three licenses were issued and uh, they fall under the purview of our police department. Uh, I don't... Uh, as far as the background checks? Oh, the background checks, those go through the state and then uh, those are then sent to us, in which the town board reviews, right? And they're, sub they're substantive. They're pretty thick packets. And anybody that's gone through either the grow or the recreational knows that it's at least a two or three month process minimum, right? And by the time we get the background check back and all the appropriate paperwork, it's, it's yay thick, give or take. Um, 
and we examine those and uh, if there's any red flags then we question uh, the person that's applying for the license we uh, inquire of law enforcement if they see any issues with it and uh, but yeah those three licenses were issued and um, as I stated earlier there hasn't been a spike in crime in my opinion nor based on the police reports that the board receives every month uh, which would be indicative of the uh, MED and or cannabis being the problem it's the opiates that are the problem when it comes to crime yeah um, how are you planning to enforce public consumption of cannabis and how do you plan on monitoring the dispensaries grows and dab lounge to ensure legal responsibility will you have the Antonito police increase patrol of cannabis within Antonito and dispensaries breaking or bending of statutes regarding amendment 64 and or municipal code if any uh, the only again these questions they come uh, to us presumably after the fact but these questions have never been raised in a, in a town board meeting uh, we do have a dab lounge so that people can consume uh, not on the street it's illegal to consume on the street not just in Antonito but anywhere in the state to my knowledge uh, not that people don't break that law but it's illegal and if we catch anybody either driving while impaired smoking on the street they've been issued citations uh, plain and simple uh, there has been concerns raised about uh, certain businesses allowing smoking on their premises that are not the dab lounge. Uh, again, the Clean Air Act is very specific as to what can happen in certain premises, such as uh, hotels, for instance. And the owner of any hotel can designate a set amount of rooms to be smoking rooms. And that's not our law, that's the Clean Air Act law. Right? So that's, a, that's their prerogative. Um, and there's numerous yeah. marijuana friendly throughout the state uh, hotels. And yeah, and, and that's, that seems to be an issue with stuff I've heard on Facebook, but nothing I've ever seen uh, personally addressed or brought up in a town board meeting. People send me texts, people send me messenger things, people send me Facebook posts uh, asking about this, and I, I respond almost immediately to most of them. And... Uh, if I don't have the answer, I bring in our town attorney and or people that do have the answer. But no formal complaints have ever been brought to us as a board. If they were, we'd look into them. I've, I have no uh, intent of ever shirking my responsibility, mayor or not. And if, if there's a formal complaint, then by all means, we'll look into it. What are your plans for the Warshower Mansion? Will it be for town hall use only? Can the public access, access the facilities for events and free or for a cost? Will preservation of the woodwork, artwork, and stone be a priority? Will historic accuracy be retained during refurbishment as much as possible? Do you plan on seeking grants to further assist? We are definitely seeking grants to further assist. Uh, I spoke to the local historical society about two months ago, and uh, according to them, uh, Dr. Uh, Goddard in particular, he said that there are uh, free grants to look at the foundation of the building to make sure that everything is stable there and we intend to pursue that. Uh, we will not touch anything inside the mansion to damage its historical authenticity. It's just not going to happen. Uh, that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened prior with previous owners, right? Uh, tile has been laid, but we didn't lay it. Uh, carpet has been laid, but we didn't lay it. We've pulled out the carpet and exposed the wood floors underneath. Uh, the grounds will be a town park, as I said earlier. The upstairs, we're hoping to make it into a municipal building where people, there's, I think there's 10 or 12 bedrooms, and then people could rent out the bedrooms for maybe a chamber of commerce, maybe a hair salon, maybe a small business. And those wouldn't be free, but it would be negligible, minimal rent. Um, and in terms of using the property like for community events, uh, I think maybe a, a deposit would be in order in case something's broken or needs cleaning. But if it's a community event and uh, people want to use it responsibly, I think so long as the deposit's uh, refundable, why not? That's a good thing. Uh, this has been answered earlier, but I'll just address it again. How will the mansion's grounds be kept regarding vehicles? We have landscape professionals, town employees, or court sentence community service recipients caretaking of the mansion grounds. Will any interior caretakers be hired or new, or new town employees to assist with the mansion? Uh, earlier I mentioned that we posted a position for a code enforcement officer. 
we recently uh, posted a position for a groundskeeper for the mansion. So we will hire somebody whose responsibility will be to take care of the mansion inside and out to make sure that it looks like it should look and that it's kept looking beautiful. Um, in terms of vehicles, that's the por portion that I've already answered. Uh, we intend to move every single vehicle that's commercial in nature uh, probably to the wastewater facility on the east end of town because that's fenced has a locked gate and has uh, ways to keep people from entering. Um, now, to the landscape professionals, the community garden, the outdoor recreational facility, and the outdoor kitchen, all of that will be run through a uh, professional landscape architect. And she or he will design a plan which the town board, whoever's on town board, will have to approve. Uh, there Yeah, Cornell's Clean Water has a, has a lease for that northwest corner for three years. And then after three years, that lease, that lease would then be renewed and or not as per the prerogative of the town board. Um, the property directly south of town hall, we're going to put in a gear library. And that's through Cornell's Clean Water as well. And the gear library is just like it sounds. People can rent tents, sleeping bags, fly fishing equipment, get access to recreational maps, and we're going to hire local youth so that they get some business acumen. Uh, by we, I mean the town, Cornell's Clean Water in particular. The town is the fiscal agent for uh, the grant, the GOCO grant, which Cornell's Clean Water received. So that 400 and approximately $450,000 grant, the town is the fiscal agent for it. And they, will, they being Cornell's Clean Water, will put in the garden, the outdoor kitchen, the gear library, and a greenhouse. And all that will be for the benefit of the community, youth in particular, but adults as well. The Cornell's Clean Water is also putting in a garden directly to the south of the SPMDTU for our veterans, a veterans garden as well. Uh, those are all meaningful and important things that are happening in our community. And uh, I'm behind them 100%. And so is the board, at least the current board is. Um, 20. Do you believe that any form of separatism currently exists in this community, such as racism, classism, nepotism, or others? Have you heard you don't belong because you're not a local, or you don't belong because you don't belong here because of your skin color? How do you plan on handling this once elected if it becomes a town member issue with residents? As I stated earlier, uh, I do not tolerate racism, sexism, uh, Anything which is divisive on grounds of sexuality, race, gender, age, I, I don't tolerate it, period, plain and simple. I think that there is some longstanding uh, fear, I think that's the accurate word actually, about outsiders, because outsiders have been equated, historically speaking, with last loss of land, loss of water rights, uh, loss of livelihoods. So I think there is some real trepidation on the part of locals to people that are outsiders. Um, so I've witnessed that my entire life, not just as a mayor. That's nothing new. Are there people that are, uh, shall we say, less than kind because of age, race, sexuality? Absolutely. But if that ever enters on my board, that person will be censured immediately. I guarantee it. Uh, there have been some arguments during town board meetings about people not knowing the community, and there's been some back and forth, but it's never been, you need to leave, you're, you're an outsider, you don't belong here. It's been, this is our community, we know what our community needs type stuff, and there has been that dynamic. Um, it wasn't necessarily healthy, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't violent. For the most part, it was, uh, it was just contentious. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Um, how often will it be available for residents of the town? And will town hall hours change? Will it be working on a website, sharing budget and expenditures publicly, or minutes or meetings? Um, I am, I said earlier, I'm 100% down with changing the town policy. We didn't invent it, we just adhere to it. If, uh, if the new board wants to bring it up as an action item, let's vote on it. Um, I've had at least one person volunteer to put up a website for us. We hired somebody to be a webmaster, but nothing ever happened. Uh, and um, if the website's up, maybe the webmaster can then 
monitor it and take care of it. Um, minutes, expenditures, budget, all those are public record. Right now, the current policy is you have to request them in writing. And uh, we're just doing our best to adhere to that. And if, um, if that changes, I don't see anybody being opposed to that. It actually makes our life easier. It's one less step in the process. Uh, but the town policy exists because it exists, and we're just trying to adhere to it. What is the expected timetable for street repaving? Well, the streets that have been repaved, uh, which are 10th, 11th, and a small portion of 8th Avenue, uh, those were part of the uh, drinking water uh, project that we had funded. And we wrote that into the budget so that when we were finished with the drinking water, we could repave. The reason that the rest of the streets were not repaved is because we also have to work on wastewater. Um, this is a very short question, but it's a very complex answer. So I'll do my best to keep it as brief as possible. When this current board took office, the town of Antonito had about $187,000 in fines from the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. Conejos had about $45,000 in fines for being out of compliance with our drinking water and our wastewater. So we, we entered into a compliance order on consent with the Colorado Department of Health. We sought funding, which we received. Of the $4.5 million, $1.1 million was loan, 0% interest, and the remaining uh, $3.4 million was grant which we do not have to repay. As such, we then brought in a state-of-the-art drinking water facility. We had to do all the infrastructure, tear everything up, put a brand new uh, tank outside of town, so now we have two tanks, right? Brand new pipe to all the residents. We also ran a line to Conejos. Their fines were also taken off the books. So our fines went away, their fines went away. When we took office, we were being threatened quite literally, it wasn't an idle threat, with $10,000 per day fines. So we entered into that so that we could get rid of the fines, get the funding that we needed, the compliance order on consent set up a timetable, and we thought that the drinking water was more important, just for the health of the community, more pertinent, more uh, relevant at the time. So we repaved the streets. We recently secured the funding for the wastewater. By recently, I mean Friday was the very last piece of the puzzle that we secured. 1.1 million in grant, 2.6 million total in grant uh, for the wastewater project. As soon as the wastewater project is completed, then we'll finish the rest of the roads. Because what we dug up for the drinking water, those lines run in parallel with the wastewater. So we didn't want to have to dig up the streets twice, having to pay for paving twice. So again, the compliance order on consent would have us done with the wastewater project uh, late 2018. Uh, late 2018, what that means to you is cold weather and asphalt and cold weather don't mix. So spring 19 would probably be the uh, latest. Hopefully the wastewater project will go a little bit more quickly and maybe by the end of the summer. But uh, we can't do it in the winter because of the asphalt having to be a certain temperature. It's a personal question that I just yeah. thought of. The roads that run to the west side of the tracks, uh, east of Main Street, are, is there going to be any sort of paving along the dirt? Well, that's where the that's the route right to the lift station, which then takes it over to the uh, to the wastewater facility. So part of the wastewater grant is to get a brand new lift station because the current lift station is just in disrepair and not doing its job to its full efficiency. Okay. Uh, so it's a five point four million dollar project, which we're trying to pare down uh, so that. Our, our constituents don't have to incur too much of the cost. But the question is about paving, and the paving is contingent upon us digging all the, the sewer lines, digging up the lift station, and getting everything set, and then repaving, much like you see in front of the school, much like you see on 10th and 11th Avenue. That was, those were streets that didn't have wastewater lines running down the middle of them. Hence, they were repaved. What is your history in Antonito? How long have you lived in town limits and been active within the community? Uh, working backwards, I've been active in the community since I first moved back uh, from college. I started as a volunteer football coach. I was the football coach for the longest time. Uh, I've taught baptism, confirmation, adult confirmation. I'm a lector, a Eucharistic minister, uh, lots of different things to the church. Uh, 
I just thought that being mayor was a logical extension of my civic mindedness and my love for my community. And I thought it might be the most direct way to help the community uh, in, a, in a more meaningful capacity. So I ran for mayor last time uh, and, and got elected. Um, I hope that I've done the best that I can. I, I think I have. Uh, I've, I've worked tirelessly to, to make that happen. Um, I've, I've lived here my whole life. If I haven't been in town limits, which I've been in town limits since 1999, 2000, so 18 years, something like that. Um, but I've lived here my whole life. I'm 46 years old, and other than going away to college, this is my hometown. Um, which brings me to an earlier question. I just realized there was a portion that I didn't answer about town hall hours. Um, the town hall hours are uh, 8.30 to 3.30, Monday through Thursday, and uh, 8.30 to, or 8 to 12 on Fridays. And uh, for the time being, those will, change, uh, those will remain the same because we only have the one town clerk. And um, so she's there on her own most of the time. If we're able to hire a part-time employee, we can, we can stay open longer. If, if it's an issue of being able to attend a meeting and if the new town board, again, the 5 p.m. time slot was something that this board inherited and nobody ever asked us to change it, I think 6 p.m. makes more sense, honestly, just because people can get here from work. Um, and I will admit there's very few people that attend town board meetings. Um, so if, if making it later will make that more conducive to people, let's do it. Why not? Absolutely. Um, anyway, I, I realized that was a portion of the pr prior question that I had not answered, so I apologize for that. Uh, do you feel that Antonito has a working relationship with, with the Cornelius County Commissioners? What benefits do you see, once selected, of working with the county to improve Antonito? Uh, I, I've said this on numerous occasions throughout the answering of these questions. I have a I think a very good relationship with all three commissioners on a, on a personal level. And every time that we've approached them for help, uh, they've always been open to it. Um, they've come to our town uh, with personal issues, but not on behalf of the county. But um, somebody asked earlier about the repaving. I could see us entering into intergovernmental agreement with the, with the county to, to help that happen sooner, honestly, so that we don't have to wait for wastewater. And uh, now that we're done with the drinking water project, which consumes very much of my time anyway, uh, I could see us pursuing an intergovernmental uh, inter agreement with the commissioners to maybe get the paving done sooner, so long as it doesn't uh, require us having to tear up the streets twice, which is the issue in the first place. The jade fiber is only alleyways, so that won't interfere. In it's there. alleyways, and uh, yeah, and uh, they're not allowed to tear up Main Street because that's a $10.1 million Main Street. Uh, and they're not allowed to tear up any new asphalt that's been put in. And if at all possible, they're going to, uh, I call it tunneling, but they're going to bore right. under existing roadways if possible. Uh, but other, everything else is going to be either on the bar ditch and or alleys okay. for uh, broadband, which Antonita will have broadband here in the very near future. But um, I have all three commissioners on, on my phone. and. I'm guessing every mayor in the county has all three commissioners on their phone. And all of them have been very open to, you know, working with us on various issues. And I don't see that changing regardless of who the mayor is. Um, we've had many projects in the last decade be built and growing from Antonita citizens and locals outside of Antonita. Are you familiar with any of these projects or involved with them in some manner? Um, that was verbatim. I don't necessarily understand the question. Uh, if, do you know what projects they're referring to? Projects to me is the Main Street project. The, I, I would say like the water, the, the solar, the, yeah, the, the solar. community garden, the, thing, the other organizations. I, yeah, the I community know. garden, we're, like I said, we're the fiscal agent for the, for the new community garden. We're providing land leased at a very, very, very reduced rate, $1 per year, so that it benefits the community for three properties for the greenhouse, for the community garden, and for the gear library. Um, we've been fundamental and instrumental, I should say, in getting Main Street installed. We did the drinking water project. The wastewater is now funded. Those things are all going to happen. Um, is the town involved outside of what you mentioned earlier about possibly using the war shower for uh, a museum, worked with the former museum owner? It's been closed for a while, and 
I, I don't even know who's running it now. I know that it's, I know that it's opening up again, but I'm 110% behind working with whomever it is to get that uh, situated in any capacity, whether I said whether it's a satellite, whether it's moving that museum over, whether it's just working in conjunction or covering a portion of history that they're not covering, you know, supplementing. If elected, are you going to allow more cannabis dispensaries, liquor stores, or other adult businesses to receive permits? On this subject, do you feel cannabis or alcohol contribute to our regional national opiate issue? Um, I think that there's been some... Uh, the notion is that marijuana is a gateway drug. Uh, I think that that is, uh, should be taken with much skepticism. I don't think that that is proven to be true. I do think that people in despair tend to self-medicate and they may start with alcohol or marijuana and when that's not, you know, conducive or help them with their despair, I think they may move on to harder drugs. Uh, so I think that corollary is, you know, the quote-unquote gateway, but I don't think that one is linked to the other uh, definitively to answer that question. Uh, in terms of cannabis dispensaries, uh, we've set the limit at three. That's up to the board. I, I think three is more than enough and it's for the town of this size. And um, so, yeah, I don't see that happening. I know that uh, feasibility studies done uh, with the uh, truck stop outside of town have indicated that they should sell liquor at the truck stop. And, again, that's going to be up to the town board. That's if they annex into the town which right now they're planning on it, but that doesn't mean they will. And if they don't annex into the town, then it's an issue for the commissioners. So would this be by, like, the old trailer that's on the, like, southwest side of 17285, or would it be... It's like directly... Beats? It's even past the Salazar trading post. It's even past uh, the narrow gauge, the other side of San Antonio Street, which is currently county. Okay. Uh, some people call it the pit. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was purchased by Mr. Cordova, and he did a feasibility study. He's working with an architect. And the feasibility study says, hey, in order for this to work as a viable business, not only does it have to be a truck stop, not only does it have to have access for 18 wheelers, not only does it have to have an RV dump, but our convenience store has to have uh, liquor and tobacco in it. Again, me as an individual, um, I, I don't drink and or smoke. Uh, take that how you will, because I don't. Uh, but I know that other people do. And it's a decision of the seven people on the board. And um, I personally would be opposed to more cannabis dispensaries. And I would hope that the liquor store that Mr. Cordova puts in is 6% uh, wine and beer only. No hard liquor, I would hope. Uh, I haven't seen his feas feasibility study in terms of what he intends to sell there. But I assume it's beer at least. Uh, and... Uh, with the Hills Liquor Store going out of business, uh, I would be inclined to listening to the proposal to see if it's a viable option for our community. Uh, but I wouldn't want it to compete on a hard alcohol level with the two liquor stores that already exist. I hope it would be more just like for campers and hunters and stuff like that. Um, what are your plans, if elected, to help the transient population in warmer months or those who are unable to care for themselves? Are you familiar with the number of Antonitos' elder population and how many live alone? Do you find this acceptable? As town employee, can you suggest anything to assist with, with are these issues? Again, how it's worded here. Um, I know that uh, the elder population and loneliness is a, a major issue in our community because many of our youth and their family members have moved away and left their parents here. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a confirmation teacher especially when I was teaching the youth, uh, one of the community service projects that I would encourage all the youth is to go visit the elderly. Uh, and uh, I think that their contribution to our community is indispensable. I think that the elders and what they've done for our community, all the burdens that they've borne for us, they deserve our respect. They deserve our attention. And uh, it's not a whole lot but we donate $1,000 every year to the senior citizens so that they can help with their planning and their meals. Um, if uh, the board is willing to consider more, I think that we should give them more, honestly. Uh, but that's just been the tradition of $1,000. That's what we've been giving them even before I came on board. Um, 
Uh, in terms of visiting, uh, we do welfare checks through our police department 10, 12, 15 a month, right? And sometimes that's for the elderly, sometimes it's for other issues, right? But um, I am aware because they're my neighbors, I know them. I go to church with them, I see them. Uh, does current, I apologize for no, interrupting, please. but does current law enforcement do welfare checks as community policing, like just freely, if they're not running traffic or any calls, go check on the neighbors and see if you have any problems in this area? Uh, to my knowledge, that's not something we're, we're good at. Maybe we should be better at. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think our former police chief uh, did that more frequently. Uh, and again, this is not a knock on our current police force. It's just they're not residents of town, so they don't live here. They just work here. So they don't have uh, the time and or the... Well, they don't, they're just not here, right? The two officers we currently have. Do you, as a former officer myself, mm -hmm. I, I see personally that as an issue. Um, obviously, I've worked in other jurisdictions I'm not familiar with, become familiar with them, mm -hmm. and then progress. And I understand that's a, a thing that you could do, but with a small community, I, I'm talking on a county level mm -hmm. for my law enforcement career. I, I did formerly work in Antonio. But uh, with community policing, that's an officer discretion type of thing. And mm -hmm. As mayor or town board, you can suggest things to the police department. And I mean, with the elder population, with the yeah. the opioid use of you know home alone kids, twenty something adults, whatever. Yeah. It, it and those suggestions show, have been knock, made. Knock on the door and say hi. Yeah. Can I help you? And um, I, I'm 100 percent behind that. Um, I, I, I will admit that that's not been brought to our attention until just now. But I think that's a wonderful idea. It would get your police force to another community and yeah. vice versa. And I think the idea of going and checking on people is wonderful. I, uh, it, the hard part with uh, being a board is having an autonomous police department where we're not infringing upon the execution of their duties. Uh, but suggestions, absolutely. Suggesting things, absolutely. Recommending things, absolutely. Mandating it, then we run into uh, issues where we're trying to, uh, well, they need to be autonomous. The police department needs to be autonomous. And so that, that's the difficulty we have with making them do those things. Yeah. Uh, number 28, concerning local businesses, including Coobers and Toltec Scenic, is there something you or as a town employee can think to bring back a summer festival to Antonita by either smaller events, business assistance, or... I, that question I forgot to finish up. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, well, the Labor Day Festival has been really great the last two years. Uh, we've contributed monetarily and logistically as best we can. Uh, Antonita together and Car Trust has done a great job with that. Um, I think that the Coombers and Toltec, uh, any time that they've reached out to us, we've been open to helping them in whatever capacity they've asked for. I've written numerous letters to get the grants for them to do their uh, uh, rail car restorations, their parlor car restorations. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, which the town didn't write, but we wrote letters of support for. Was the former festival that used to be held over there uh, just south of the, the railroad um, depot a uh, town event, or was that a county event? Uh, that predated uh, my tenure as mayor. I think it was a town event, okay. but I don't know that for a fact. I can't speak to that. I know I attended it. Yeah, the festival was the one question I think that uh, the person asking this was, was curious about because Manassa has theirs. But well, we have our Labor Day now. Right, right. And uh, again, that's mostly Antonita together in Colorado Trust, but the board has helped in any way they've asked. We've, we've done our best to provide monetary or logistical or uh, town employee assistance, closing off streets, sweeping streets, whatever needs to be done, providing law enforcement so they can monitor events, issuing permits. And we've been very good about that. Um, uh, law enforcement on Tito has often had a high turnover rate with newer officers moving on to quote-unquote larger agencies which can afford better pay or advancement opportunities. If elected, what is your stance on having police commissioner in place? If a commissioner is in place and Anthony the officers have a grievance with the commissioner requesting something... I didn't finish that question either, I'm sorry. Commissioner com uh, requests an Anthony the officer um, to say check on a, a family issue, like, you know, secretively. Would, uh... That's not... That's not something we should do. I, I agree. Uh, I, I think that was... We do have a police, to, uh, the police commissioner. The police commissioner is Trustee Lucero. Um, and um, he works directly with the police department and he reports stuff to the board if and when there's issues. 
Uh, but to the turnover, it was a humongous issue when we first started. I'd say uh, with the exception, we had an interim chief, but he was he had been here for a while anyway. But every other officer was part-time from other uh, jurisdictions, other agencies. And uh, for a little over two years, we had three full-time officers, no part-timers whatsoever. Uh, our SIRSA rating, which is our insurance, our audit through SIRSA went from a 40-something percent up to a 90-something percent because we were able to stabilize the police department. Uh, when Chief Taylor went to the state patrol, admittedly, more money, more opportunity, probably higher prestige, just a guess, um, you know, we were proud of him. And his position is currently being posted. Uh, and uh, our intent is to keep full-time officers in place, not part-time officers. Is that NEO currently, the, speaking for the current board, uh, open to hiring an outsider for the chief position? Someone that doesn't live Well, in right now so. our chief, our interim chief is an outsider, and he had applied previously. Again, I can't go into the whole thing just for privacy reasons. But our preference has been, I can say that, to hire a local. And there are a few post-certified locals, but they work for well, the State Patrol being one of them and or the Sheriff's Department being others. So if, uh, if there's a post-certified local that wants to apply for chief, uh, in the past that's been our preference. That's all I can say about that. Okay. Um, I know there's some issue about... Uh, the police uh, department, the two officers that live in La Hara taking the vehicle to their residence. Again, that was uh, not that the insurance uh, mandates policy to the town of Antonito, but they told us this is in your best interest if these officers, especially if they're on call, that they have a police vehicle on location in case they need to respond at a high rate of speed, in case there's an emergency, that they can come on a legitimate police vehicle. And that's one of the reasons that our SIRSA audit went from 40-something percent to 90-something percent. Okay. Our officers wear body cameras. That's another reason that our SIRSA rating went up. How long ago that, was that implemented? Uh, that was implemented uh, shortly after the events in Maryland. Okay. Uh, so a little over a year ago. Uh, uh, it might have been first discussed after Trayvon Martin and just the, how police departments were being called into question in terms of how they interact with the public. And I am, my grandfather was a five-term sheriff. My first cousin is a officer in uh, Littleton. I have the utmost respect for the police department. Those body cameras are for their protection as well as the public's. And it works both ways. And that's something that we definitely uh, discussed as a board. And it cost a little bit of money, honestly. But it was it's worth it in the long run, in my opinion, to have that technology available uh, for everyone's benefit. Not just our constituents, but also for our law enforcement. We were on number 30, but I think you skipped 29. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, some residents are concerned over the family working together. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh, some residents are concerned over the issue of family working together within the town of Antonito, which ties into some nepotism-related curiosity. Do you feel that family members, immediate or distant, should be allowed to work together, and does this include executive sessions? Uh, working backwards again, family is not an executive session if there are family members being discussed, ever. Okay. Um, and... It's never even been an issue. The family members have always recused themselves if they've had a family member being discussed. Um, now, in terms of nepotism, um, to my knowledge, there are currently no family members working within town. We have a town employee whose brother-in-law works part-time. Uh, there were some uh, d more direct family, uh, you know, employee relationships that existed, but they don't work. That particular family uh, nepotism, if you will, is no longer an issue because the only family members we have now are one town employee who has a brother-in-law who works part-time. Uh, the person who brought this question up was referring to the two officers. And I oh, don't know the if you still have them. Uh, they're, they're married to one another. Uh, 
And um, that's one of the reasons that they don't report to one another. So our officer doesn't report to uh, the chief because, well, they're married. So the officer used to report to the previous chief and now reports to the town administrator. Uh, I could totally see that becoming an issue, though, absolutely. Uh, again, it's just a matter of, um, for this current position, it's been posted for three months. Zero applicants. Uh, the pay's not the best, and that's with raises. We've raised the salary considerably. Not a lot, but we've raised it much higher than it used to be. But if I'm to understand correctly, that's not unique to Antonito. I understand there's a shortage of law enforcement everywhere. Uh, but yeah, the current position's been posted for three months, and uh, as of last month's meeting, zero applicants. Uh, but yeah, there is some, uh, the nepotism is uh, not through uh, blood per se, but through marriage, if, uh, if we're using that term, right? Uh, but it's just because those two are the ones that applied and they were hired and they don't report to one another. Okay. Uh, where are we now? Just so you know, question number 31 actually is from a war shower descendant. Okay. Um, wouldn't the mansion be an asset for the town? 175000 is a bargain for this building. And with renovation and restoration, the value would surely increase. In addition, it could be a tourist attraction and hopefully bring more tourist dollars to the area, particularly if there were a museum-type display in the building in addition to town offices. The town offices is just one very uh, integral to the town, obviously, but in terms of the total 9,000 square feet, the town offices is minimal. We, we plan on having a museum. We plan on having a town park. We are going to seek funding. I imagine any sitting board, whether I'm the mayor or not, is going to seek funding to make that mansion as historically accurate as possible. And the museum is just one part of bringing tourism in there. If we can get the ch Chamber of Commerce, by we I mean as a community, not as a town board, up and running again, I'd, I'd love to have the Chamber of Commerce situated there. I would love to have an information booth with all the different recreational opportunities in our community there. Okay. Um, and picnics and have that place be the place where everybody goes to, uh, to congregate, to heal, to reconcile, to make it uh, a lasting part of our community. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we pursued it. Not because it was a bargain, although it was. We pursued it because there was some overtures to buy the building and strip it of all its wood and leave a shell of a building. And we didn't want another empty building in our community, especially that one, because of its historical significance. Uh, this may be a question later on, but since we're on the subject, what's going to happen to Town Hall, uh, the current? Well, it's being voted on. Um, okay. Because of uh, state statutes, if it was ever used for municipal purposes, it has to go to the voters before it can be sold. Okay. Uh, if the voters agree to sell it, then we're going to sell it, and that money would be earmarked to pay, out, pay down the mansion, if not pay it off. Um, because it was a bargain, uh, uh, we... Uh, it depends on what we sell this for, assuming the voters approve it, right? We may be able to pay off the entire note. It'll definitely be a substantial portion of it. Um, but yeah, because of state statute, we have to vote on whether or not we can sell Town Hall. Uh, if we don't sell it, then we, we're in dire need of a bigger shop. Um, so we'll probably turn it into a bigger shop for our maintenance vehicles. Because some of our vehicles don't fit in the current shop that we have. Uh, but we'd hope to sell it so that we can pay down our uh, our debt on the mansion. Area that used to be the former police station like, that used to be next to the laundry yeah. mat, is that town property still? Yeah, and that's where the gear library is going to be. Okay. So uh, that's where we're going to have the recreational facility so people can rent tents, fishing right. equipment, I, etc. I forgot you mentioned that. Yeah. So that will be our new uh, gear library. Are we on the county jail? Uh, 32, I believe. Yeah. The uses for the mansion, will it be used to build a town jail for housing intoxicated parties or minor crimes, or will Antonito stick to using the county jail? Uh, we're going to stick to using the county jail. Uh, we've had some issues with the previous sheriff, the one who currently, uh, uh, just recently resigned, I should say, uh, wasn't taking town warrants. So that, that presented a real issue, not just for Antonito, but La Jara, Sanford, and Manassa, because apparently the jail was being renovated and town warrants weren't being taken. So... Uh, we had some uh, some issues with that, but now that with the current sheriff and the potential for uh, for change in that particular office, 
Yeah, we, we hope to keep using the county jail. That's what it's designed for. And uh, there will not be a jail or a holding facility within the mansion. Unless the new board wants it. But that's never been discussed. Oh, uh, will the mansion have space for community events? How much of the mansion will you allow to the public? Now during renovation, within safety limits, and in the future once moved into, what will become of the former town hall? Working backwards, I just said, if the voters approve it, we're going to sell the town hall to uh, pay off some of the debt on the mansion, maybe all of the debt on the mansion. We'll see. Um, as long as we're not in there with hard hats and uh, people get permission to come and look at the mansion, come look at it. It belongs to us. It belongs to the community. It's for all of us. Uh, once it's open, it's going to be for everybody. They can come in as long as it's within business hours. Um, what, uh, how much will be allowed for the public? Well, the entire acre is going to be for the public. It's going to be town park. And the indoor, uh, you know, the town hall is only going to be the dining room. Right? The rest can be for community offices, for a uh, police station will be downstairs, not with the jail, just for offices, right? Uh, it used to be a bingo parlor. I could totally see the seniors or anybody that wanted to use it for events used downstairs in that big uh, open area. The, the, the reason I ask um, for myself immediately went to the maker type movement, you know, just making things out of whatever you have. Is there something that could be done here for the youth and adults? Because yeah. there's a lot of makers in the valley that like to create, whether it's mm -hmm. religious retablos type things or, or whether it's just a, a simple electronic gizmo. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, if people want to rent out individual offices, that was our that was our idea for the municipal building, so they could have their own little studio, their own office, right? Now, for community events, uh, the downstairs is pretty significant size-wise, right? And, you know, people well, want to have receptions there or community functions. Will the I bar see. stay, and if so, does the town have the ability to sell alcohol? No, there is the, the, the bar is a literal bar. I mean... Uh, constructed bar, but it's not a bar where people are going to sell alcohol. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a physical bar. The yeah. question I'm asking, I guess, is if uh, someone were to rent it out for like a, a quinceanera, a wedding, something, would they be able to serve alcohol? That would be up to the board. They'd have to apply for a special permit. And once they get the special permit, uh, they'd have, well, they don't get the special permit. They apply. They have to post for a minimum of 10 days public notice. And then there has to be a public hearing. And then after the public hearing, the board votes on it. And if, uh, you know, hey, if the board approves it for one day, then it's a one-day event. Okay. And typically, whoever applies for the permit also applies for security and or uh, law enforcement to oversee. That would not be an expense incurred by the town. But special permits are granted rarely, uh, but they must be applied for. And then once they're applied for, uh, they need to post for 10 days, and then the public hearing happens, and then the board votes. Did I answer your question? You did. Thank you. I think three, four. Why are you running for town board position and what makes you the best candidate? I think I'm the best candidate for the reasons I've mentioned all along. I, I love my community. I'm an extremely hard worker. I'm not to sound arrogant. Uh, I have uh, connections not only locally, not only in the Valley, but statewide, as does my opponent. We're both intelligent. Uh, so in that regard, uh, I think that we have many of the same skill sets. I think we have, honestly, a lot of the same sentiments. Uh, I think the discernible difference between me and my opposition is just tenure in the community and uh, the fact that uh, my entire adult life has been dedicated to this community in one capacity or another. And regardless of what happens on Tuesday, and I mean this sincerely, that's not going to change. I'm going to dedicate my the rest of my adult life to making my community the best it can be i just think that i am in a better position to do that as a mayor um, if if god doesn't want me to be mayor then i won't be mayor but it's not going to change who i am and what my love for my community is um, i'm always available uh, for former players for students for youth for anybody that calls on me i've and again, if I've turned somebody away, I apologize, but I don't think I have. I've always done my best to be human and treat people with the utmost dignity. That's, that's just the, my code. And when I fail at that, I'll, I'll apologize because I, I screw up 
just like everybody else. But that's my, that's my default, to treat people with dignity and to treat people with kindness. And I think that's what our community needs, really. I think that's the, that's the linchpin to, res to restoring our community. Um, but why am I the best candidate? Why am I running for town board? Because I, I, I love my community. And that's just what I've dedicated my life to. And I think this affords me the best opportunity to, to help my community. Yeah. What would you do to attract more visitors to add income to the town and businesses in the area? I think we're doing it. New Main Street, new infrastructure. If I'm a business and I want to come to Antonito, I want my infrastructure to be in place. I don't want to have to worry about sewer. I don't want to have to worry about water. I don't want to have to worry about transportation and Main Street. I want all those big infrastructure things in place. Plus, it, it's a good for the health of the community. Um, working directly with the railroad, with local businesses, all those things are important. But mostly, I think we just need to cash in on our, uh, our treasures, Actually, which is our outdoors, our heritage, our language, our traditions. Working with the railroad, Canales Clean Water started because of railroad bringing in, you know, the, the, the nuclear waste. Yeah, the nuclear waste from Los Alamos and mm -hmm. transloading, I think was the proper term. Mm -hmm. um, have you had a good relationship with, I think it's San Luis and Rio Grande, or are you speaking of the... I was speaking of the narrow gauge railroad. Oh, okay. Because okay. um, uh, the concern is the, the cars sitting on the tracks all the time. Yeah, and I've spoken with Matt Abbey about the cars sitting on the tracks, and... Uh, that's how they make their money. They rent out storage for cars. So Matthew Abbey of the Rio Grande is yeah. this line? It's not at Ellis? Well, I've only spoken with Matt Abbey. And uh, when I called Matt Abbey, he indicated that the railroad out of Alamosa, they make some of their money by storing cars, mostly out by South Fork and Del Norte. Right. And then when people call for their cars, they got to move the cars down this line and then deliver the cars to whomever they own to. So while they're moving cars to, let's say, Denver, then the cars that they moved out of the way sit here. Okay. And then they move them back towards South Fork so that this line can start running again. And, yeah, they sit here for sometimes a month. Um, but to the relationship with the railroad, uh, that was strained before we took uh, office. That was strained before Los Alamos, and it had to do with the depot. And they're still not letting us access that eastern corner. Uh, and we've done, we got a grant to restore much of the depot, but that eastern corner we can't touch because uh, the one time I called Matt Abbey wanting to talk about the depot, he says, you have to talk to my lawyer. That was the first thing out of his mouth, other than hello. Um, so there is a, there's definitely a strained relationship with, with a rail line. Uh, I would, again, I, I'd hate to have to have the lawyers get involved, but every time we talk about the depot, that's that's their... Okay, now the first. depot that is the, the historic depot here. Historic depot, absolutely. Okay. Now, the historic depot, I was part of the Colorado Preservation window, learning how to restore yeah. historic windows, and uh, they had said that the east side of the building was completely off limits past the sidewalk. Yeah. Is that that's true? That's the eastern corner I'm talking about. Because oh, okay. it sits at a diagonal. It's hard to, that's true. on a recording, it's hard to envision, but they're, they don't run in parallel. They're kind of, uh, they run at, a, at an acute angle to one another. Uh, but yeah, beyond the sidewalk on that eastern side, we can't touch. And uh, any uh, overtures to do so, like I said, uh, talk to our lawyer. That's what we were told. But that that depot issue, that preceded this board. That was uh, maybe even 10 years ago that that became an issue. And the wastewater is funded. The drinking water is funded. Those have been albatrosses in, in good ways for this town board because we had to get rid of the $187,000 of fine, the $45,000 of fine for Quinaus, because we had a consent order that we had to fulfill and meet the deadlines therein, right? So those have just been taking so much of our time, but one is done, the other is funded now. And now we can move on to other projects. And Main Street's done too. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's work on getting those things taken care of, absolutely. Whoever's in office. Okay. How do you feel about inner office relationships? Uh, to my knowledge, there aren't any, but I think they're referring to the police department. Uh, and again, that was uh, not necessarily by choice, and we're definitely aware of that relationship, and we're not asking them to get divorced so that they can take care of their family. I mean, uh, and 
that's one of the reasons that we had the police commissioner make sure that they're reporting to different uh, supervisors. Um, when we had three officers, uh, they were very rarely on duty together. Uh, we did establish an overlapping schedule so that people wouldn't know what our schedule was. So it seems like sometimes the criminals know the schedule better than everybody else. So we'd alter it uh, to best uh, mitigate that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not something that we would normally do by choice, but out of necessity, that's where, that's where we're at with the police department. And if we had other applicants when we hired the two officers, you know, that might have been a consideration, but those are the applicants we had, and um, our, uh, our police force has been very stable. And I, I keep talking about the audit because, the, I mean, we were audited. Our police department was audited. And when I took office, our score was a 45 or 46 percent, something like that. And now it's a 92. So clearly there's been some positive things happening. Okay. Um, uh, could it cause issues for town residents, tourists, or the town? If so, and why? It, it could definitely cause issues, um, assuming they were to work in cahoots against the town interest, against uh, a particular family member, uh, a, a resident. Absolutely, that could be an issue. Um, I don't think any board would allow that to happen if it was brought to their attention, however. Those are fireable offenses. Those are... And, and those are criminal I, offenses. I think that's the concern that was brought up as if retaliatory reason. If you have the two officers, they have a domestic, let's say. Yeah. What happens? Well, obviously the sheriff would have to take at least a, a certain responsibility in an interim basis. And as I iterated earlier, we have that third position posted. If, if we have that third officer in place, then that would fall upon them. And we have utilized part-time officers in the past that's always an option and they're still on our you know call list if we need them it was just draining our our funds to have so many part-time officers so we as a board decided it's better to have a full-time police department okay. and uh, but yeah if, if that were to ever come to fruition god forbid then we would call upon our former part-time officers and our sheriff department to help police and, and we have that infrastructure in place. We just haven't had to utilize it recently. Okay. Um, if you are an incumbent, share with us what you have done for the town. Uh, I've kind of talked about that already, but, uh, you know, this current board has brought in $15.1 million in grants and funding. I'd say about 70% of that is grants. And then if you count the last two weeks, we've brought in an additional 5.4. So we're up to 20.5 million in four years. That's good. Uh, and like I said, the 15.1 million that we put on the banners, uh, that's when the banners were printed. But in the last two weeks, we've received funding for wastewater to the tune of 5.4 million. Uh, some of that is directly related to the town. Some of that we're fiscal agent for. But Main Street alone, I've said this several times already, $10.1 million uh, drinking water. 4.5 million of that 4.5 million uh, and of the 10.1 million we hired a local contractor so that money stays in town we hired local employees we hired local flaggers uh, and if they were local they were at least from the valley so that money would stay in the general vicinity all of that's for the benefit of the town so yeah you go yeah let's talk uh, 20 uh, 20.5 million dollars in four years of that $20.5 million, I'd say at least 80% of it has been spent on local employees, local contractors, and if not directly local, Valley. And uh, that's good for our community. And uh, I just talked about the police force. I know that there's some issues about uh, the two officers being married. Uh, but when we had three officers, uh, it was definitely a little bit better off uh, than where we are now. But we stabilized the police department. Um, well, tax revenue, I just I talked about that at the very beginning of the interview. It's at least gone up by 128 with Main Street. Uh, I'm sure hometown, the liquor stores, the restaurants, all the other businesses on Main Street, I'm thinking are benefiting from the increased traffic and the better look of town. So our, our sales tax has gone up considerably, which has afforded us the mansion, the track hole, the front end loader the new police vehicles, new used police vehicles. 
the new used fleet vehicles, the new used trash truck. That's how we're funded those things because we're growing. Okay. Um, if you are new to the board, what are your two top goals? Well, I'm not new to the board, but I would definitely love to work on the opiate crisis. And I would like to work on uh, more beautification of the actual town, not infrastructure things, but things that people see, boom, first thing they walk into town, first time they drive into town, they just see something that isn't underground. Broadband, great for the town, underground. Drinking water, great for the town, underground. Uh, new uh, drinking water facility, above ground, but outside of town. See what I'm saying? Uh, new galley for the taking water from the Conales River to get to our uh, homes, five miles away. All those things aren't readily evident. So no, I'm not new to the board, but I definitely want to work on the opiate crisis because it's, it's breaking up families. And like I said earlier, one of the best things for our community is to be reconciled, to be whole. And families need to be whole in order for that to happen. And the other top goal would definitely be to, you know, other than bringing more business, which I think that's already happening, is to work on just beautification of the town in general. Uh, there's federal funding available for blighted houses. Let's, let's knock down some blighted houses through federal funding, with federal funding, so that um, families can get compensated for their property that they can't use because the house is on it, but they don't have the wherewithal to knock it down. Uh, and uh, there's federal funding available through Senator Gardner's office. That announcement came out about a week and a half ago. Okay. And again, regardless of who's mayor, I think either one of us should pursue that. How important is it for you and the entire town board to get along and work together? It's, it's not imperative. Like I said earlier, it's good that we have dissenting opinions. I, I, I truly believe that. We, we should have difference of opinions. We just shouldn't hate each other for it. What do you see as the biggest problem facing Antonito that no one wants to talk about? Uh, the opiate crisis, of which I've mentioned over and over again, which would be one of the main things we need to get under control. Not just in Antonito, the county, the valley, and the state, and the nation. As current mayor and, and candidate for mayor, wh why do you think that people don't talk about the opioid crisis locally? Is it oh, I think they do. Relationship or, well. Yeah, I just. Uh, that no one wants to talk about was the question. You, yeah. You fight opioids, so I'm just. Oh, I got you, I got you. Yeah, that nobody wants to talk about. I think we're pretty open about all our problems. I think that's part of the issue, is that, oh, so-and-so said this, and then we just don't talk to each other anymore. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, a lot of word of mouth and stuff. A lot of word of mouth, a lot of accusations, a lot of hyperbole, a lot of conjecture, and very little of it uh, coincides with the facts. Uh, I think part of our issue is that we talk too much about our problems without actually talking to the person who's maybe the source of the problems. Let's try and figure this out before we put something on Facebook. Let's talk to one another, like my grandpa used to say, como la gente. And if we can talk to each other, then we can heal. Um, but yeah, there's, there's lots of problems that exist in our community. But I guess I've been saying all along, this is not a, a way to back out of responsibility, abdicate responsibility, by no means. These problems are not unique to Antonito. They are human problems. And where humans exist, those problems will exist. So our leadership needs to be somebody, a group of people, that are willing to confront those problems in restorative ways, as opposed to divisive ways. I think that this is the board for that, the current board. And I, I'm willing to lead that charge. And I would hope that whoever gets elected would be willing to pick up that, that torch as well. What do you see as the past positive improvements of the town? And if you could improve on those improvements, what would you do and how? Um, I don't know what past positive improvements, uh, do you know what they're referring to? I, I honestly don't. I would assume it's probably like the water and the roads and why weren't the roads done immediately? After, yeah, they weren't know, done immediately just because um, we didn't want to dig them up twice. Um, you know, I think if, uh, when new businesses come in, I think we need to incentivize them uh, but maybe not give them tax breaks for the, the dollar store got, I think, a four- or five-year tax break, which wasn't this board. It was a, a prior board, right, just to get the dollar store into town. And I could see giving them an incentive, but I don't see it being four or five years, right? I think that there needs to be uh, some give and take there. They're, they're benefiting from this community as well. Yeah. And that tax break is going to expire here pretty soon. 
which will be more sales tax for our community. Um, in terms of improvements, I mean, we got rid of the mill levy. Uh, we paid it off early. So property owners are going to see a reduction in their taxes uh, in the 18-19 cycle because we paid off the mill levy, uh, 18 mill levy, four years early. Uh, again, because we have the fiscal capacity to do so. Um, what would you do uh, to make Antonito a safer and happier place to live? I think we all need to get along a little bit better. I would like to be a, an agent for change in that regard, whether it's town hall type forums where we discuss our differences. Uh, it would be definitely looking into and tackling the drug problem. It would definitely be bringing more business into town, therefore more jobs, which would, in my mind, mitigate some of the despair, which leads to the issues that we have in the first place. But a safer, happier place is just people uh, living in accord with one another. We don't have to invite each other to baptisms and uh, graduation parties. We just need to get along a little better. I w I'm going to dedicate my life to that, mayor or not, plain and simple. Would you support alternative mean of city revenue, and what would they be? I think that means means of city revenue. I believe so. How would you do it, and in what time frame do you think results would be seen? I could see the excise tax working if there was enough uh, uh, time to go through Tabor, and Tabor asks all sorts of different stipulations for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which are very difficult things to prove, like what do you estimate the increase in taxes would be? Well, we could do that if we took our time with it, if all the grows were up and running, the tomato shop, the hemp uh, grow, all our wholesale opportunities, I think the excise tax is a workable solution. It just right now, it's not fiscally responsible for us to do it because we'd be spending more on the officer to collect the fees than we would be getting from the fees at the moment. Uh, I would hate to see an increase in sales tax, uh, although, I mean, that's definitely an opportunity. We'd have to go through the voters again. I mean, as a means of revenue. But I think the best means of revenue is just getting more businesses to come to Antonito. And uh, we've approved 11 businesses in the four years that we've been on the board. Uh, granted, six of them are having to do with the recreational, but five are not. Right? Um, so those 11 businesses and then the two gas stations coming into town, those all bode well for us, in my opinion. Um, how would you like to expand or add to Antonito's economy? That's kind of the same thing, but the infrastructure is in place. Uh, there's empty buildings on Main Street that I'm sure would want to be rented. Um, but yeah, just bringing more opportunity for people to work, more businesses, allowing current businesses within reason to expand. Those are important things. Um, do you as an incumbent or newly appointed candidate agree with past and future improvements of the town of Antonito? Well, as an incumbent, uh, would, I have a, would I have preferred to spend our time and energies on other issues other than water and wastewater? To a certain degree, yes. From a health perspective, no. I mean, we have safer water now. Now we're going to have safer uh, wastewater. In terms of infrastructure, no. But would I have liked our energies as a board and as a mayor to have been focused on uh, maybe immediate beautification things? Absolutely. Would I have liked my time to be spent? I have 120 pages of emails, and there's like 40 or 50 emails per page. There may be more than 120 pages. That was last count. And, you know, those things are, you know, just time consuming. And... Um, with some of that infrastructure out of the way and funded and ready to go, then I think the new board, whoever it is, can focus on those things which are important to people. Not that those th other things aren't, but just more obvious to the community. Okay. Um, so yeah, I agree with the, with the past and future improvements. I think they're needed uh, for lots of different reasons, but I'd like to see more. Uh, what kind of new businesses do you think the community could use and why? I would like to see a, a micro-lending uh, economy instituted in the community. Uh, there's lots of people that can work out of their home. And, hey, maybe somebody's a really good crochet or a quilter. But they don't have enough money to buy the four or $500 worth of supplies. So maybe we'll work with a local uh, bank and or financial institution 
to institute these micro lending, and then they can sell their wares at maybe the Dutch Mill, maybe the cafe, uh, maybe at the railroad, right? Maybe they can set up a, a little booth on Main Street so that they can have these uh, places to sell what they're good at, their God-given talents, uh, those types of businesses. Um, I, I said earlier, I don't think we need more cannabis. Uh, I would be uh, remiss if I said that we needed more hard liquor in Antonito, but a liquor store would have to be looked at you know, very diligently. I'd love to see a, a pharmacy come back to Antonito so that our residents, our elderly residents in particular, wouldn't have to go to La Jara or Alamosa to get their prescriptions. I've pursued... Is there a service here that does that? Like Sawatch, the pharmacist uh, out of Mani, I think, delivers to Sawatch once a week? Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't. There is a vehicle service. There's people that drive people to doctors. SLB and, yeah, SLB transportation. Um, but uh, I talked to Mr. Valdez uh, out of La Jara Pharmacy about, you know, possibly putting a pharmacy here in Antonito, and uh, it's not that he's opposed to it, it's just that, again, overhead, and whether we like it or not, we are such a litigious society that insurance is the biggest uh, obstacle to so many different businesses getting up and running. Just the cost of insurance alone often is, uh, dis dissuades, again, with no definitive numbers, I'd say a majority, a vast majority of new businesses from ever getting in place. And that's why micro-lending works, because you work out of your home. And you can... Uh, just produce on a minuscule or a marginal level, marginal not in a bad way as an inferior product, but marginal, and you don't have to be uh, producing lots of things, just a few things. Um, so yeah, I think how about, that's... How about like something uh, like the Rainbow or the, the former Golden Nugget or any of those opening up again and, and becoming a public community area? For dances, for well, I mean, Rusty Spurs. Yeah, Rusty Spurs gone, but that's a archery range now. But um, they still hold dances at the Rainbow, not very often, but they do. Most people go to the Parish Hall now, not for dances, but for community events. Right. Um, but yeah, I think anything that provides for community coming together is a good thing. Uh, the Golden Nugget used to be an opera house. Can you imagine if it were back to an opera house or a theater like it used to be? Again, a historical building, but it's under private ownership. And um, so often the onus falls on the private owner to seek funding. And so that's the difficulty there. Not that the town can't help and write letters of support. We wrote letters of support for the SPMDTU, and they recently got funded for, I think, 200 and some thousand dollars. We wrote letters of support for uh, the railroad, and they got their grants to restore the rail cars. So if the private owners or the owners are willing to take on the, the responsibility of seeking funding, the town should be behind them, always. Okay. But I don't think that's something that we should, we need to allow them their autonomy. We can't dictate our wishes on private owners. That's one of the reasons the gas station was such an issue this summer, because we couldn't intervene and tell a private owner what to do with his property. You just can't do it. Does the town have its own gas pump now for... Yeah, we, we use our tax exempt status. That's one of the things I instituted. By, by I, I mean, I'm the one that pursued it and then the board voted on it. Uh, just so that we could get um, our gas tax free. Okay. So we save about 40 cents minimum per gallon on diesel and uh, regular fuel. Okay. And then we have a, a discount on our lubricants as well. Transmission oil and stuff like that. And we go through Alta. Oh, okay. We took bids from the Monta Vista Co-op and Alta. And Alta was a few cents cheaper. And they said they could deliver to us weekly. And we were about ready to start the water project. So we needed somebody that could deliver to us a little bit more frequently and just a little bit of a reduced cost, so we went with Alta. But yeah, we, we saved a ton of money by getting it tax-exempt, by using our tax-exempt status. Okay. Regarding community business, marijuana is legal in Antonito, though not in Conos County, quote-unquote, or in parentheticals for sale. And we're told there is a commissioner who is for the ban in county on cannabis products, voting no against it but also is alleged to run an Antonito cannabis shop in town limits. Um, that's just not true. I mean, uh, I know that the, there is a commissioner who owns the building, but he leases it to a tenant. So he's not running it, but he does benefit from it. Um, that's his business. I mean, I... Yeah, and I can understand that from a, a 
as a as a citizen of, of Antonito, a resident of Antonito, do you, I guess, what's your stance as a public official on someone that is a commissioner saying no to other people, but kind of tying in a yes to their own personal business? I got what you mean. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, well, that, um, I don't know if, I don't think we can mention names, so we probably shouldn't. Um, but what it really boils down to in this regard is um, I know that they've voted for no before it was legal in Antonito. I don't know that this commissioner has voted on it no since. Okay. So when the commissioners voted no, it was still not legal in Antonito, to my knowledge. I think that's the timeline. And so the litmus test, in my opinion, for the accusation being levied in number 47 is if it came to a vote again after it is legal. Okay. Uh, I think that's the issue. And uh, do they benefit indirectly or directly? I'm, I, I can't speak to that. I think the optics of it is that they do. And who they lease their property to is their business. Um, that being said, I think that this question 47, because it is accusatory, even though it's not explicit in its accusations, I think had this particular uh, commissioner voted no after it was legal in Antonito, then would have an issue. Okay. Uh, as to their personal stance now, I have no clue. If they're going around saying they're opposed to it. And, um, and we, Antonito News doesn't know either. I, I just asked yeah. as we were asked, and uh, I wasn't aware that this was a prior yeah. vote. So. But I think that's a timeline issue. And if, if the litmus test is, did they vote no after it was legal, then I think that there is, uh, there's grounds to pursue it further. But to my knowledge, the, the no vote was prior. Okay, and I think most of the rest of these, except for the latter, maybe five or ten questions, are just kind of like personal, who are you, what are you about, what are your achievements type of questions. So if you want to yeah, what are my, some of them together, that's fine. What are my professional achievements are you most proud of? Uh, well, I won a Colorado Creative uh, Governor's Award last year, which I'm super proud of, you know. I mean, uh, there were three of us in the entire state, and I, I won one. And I was, I'm, I'm proud of that because I represented my hometown, and the governor awarded me with this Creative Leadership Award. I don't know how many applicants there were, but I was one of three selected mm -hmm. and brought up to Breckenridge, all expenses paid, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the football team that uh, Coach Mike and I uh, – not just the one team that was excellent, but all the football teams that we coached and the good young men that most uh, are becoming. I'm proud of that. Um, I'm proud of my work with uh, religious ed and uh, the work that I've done for my church. I'm proud of the work I've done as mayor. Um, that doesn't mean everybody has to like me, but uh, I've, I've done my best and everything I pursue, I do my best. I'm a good teacher, I'm a good professor, I think I'm a good, I don't think, I know I'm a good human being. Uh, and um, I bring that sense of responsibility to everything I do, everything. And um, I, I, I know how to work, and I will always work for my community. Um, obstacles? Yeah, of course we've all faced challenges, and how to overcome the challenge. Faith is my way of overcoming challenges, and I always uh, try and overcome challenges if I have my faith. What one skill makes you the most qualified for the position you are running for? Not to sound uh, like I'm bragging or anything. Um, I think it's that I'm able to understand human nature. I'm willing to listen to everybody and put everybody's ideas into a synthesized and workable solution as best I can. Uh, some people see it as maybe being too nice. People see it as maybe being uh, accommodating. And to a certain extent, it is accommodating. But my number one skill is I'm a listener. I'm not very vocal. I don't like to go out and toot my own horn. This is foreign to me, what we're doing right here, this interview things. I, I, it's not something I, I like necessarily. I'm not quiet. Obviously, I can talk a book. Uh, but I listen to everyone. And I will always take everybody's opinion into consideration to make the best decisions possible. And uh, my default, like I said earlier, is treat people with dignity. 
And that's going to be the, the one lens I view every decision that I, that I make. So that's my number one skill is that I'm a good listener, I think. Um, and again, 48 through roughly yeah, 52 are kind of all similar. Working style. I, I'm, a, I'm a service leader. I'm not a, I'm not a crack the whip. I'm a service leader. I lead by example. Uh, I believe that we have competent and professional people in place and uh, I will assist them to their highest potential. If they do something wrong, then yeah, by all means, let's call them, take them to task. Let's call them out on it. But I'm a service leader. Lead by doing, not by intimidation, not by uh, let's make uh, people's life difficult so that they leave. Let's, let's fix it. Let's get things done. Let's work together. That's the way I work. Um, what excites you about the position? Helping people. Um, what is your name? Uh, my name is Aaron Abeda. I'm 46 years old. I'm running for mayor. What does it mean to me as an individual? It means that I can best serve my community. Uh, and what do you feel your position allows for the town, for better or worse? My position allows my considerable skills to go to the betterment of my community. Uh, and I will always strive for that. How could you improve the health, welfare, and education in the community if you could? Uh, health, with, we're working on that with, uh, with the water. Health, opiate is a big health crisis. Welfare is, let's go visit the people. I thought that was an excellent idea that you talked about earlier. Welfare is, let's get people working, absolutely. Bring in industry, get new jobs. Education, um, education is something that this town board has always voted for. If there's kids involved, we've always voted in favor of it. Every single time. We've never said no. And uh, I don't think any town board would do that. So if it, if it benefits youth and community and education, we've always said yes. Um, uh, how would you and the team agree to disagree? That's well, I don't quite understand. Through, through discussion. I mean, that's, that's the Robert's Rules of Order. I mean, let's have an open discussion. Let's just not hate each other afterwards. Uh, what do you see as the most important challenges confronting Anthemico in the community? I think I've answered that on several occasions. Uh, this lists them in the order priority and discuss how we attempt to solve. Well, because of the fiscal issues, the water and the sewer uh, was the biggest because of the $10,000 a day fines that we inherited and the 187000 that we as a town inherited, as this board, I should say. So that, from a triage issue, the, the water took precedent. Uh, and we were about to start Main Street. So those two humongous projects took precedent right off the, right off the bat for the first two or three years of our uh, term. And the water project just finished last year. So the new projects are the wastewater, which is still part of our compliance order. Um, new projects, just artwork and uh, more community involvement and uh, cultural and community events which are artistic in nature. I would love to see that happen. On a, on a much larger scale than it is now. Uh, we talked to Mr. Haber, off the, the topic that you just brought up, the artwork. Um, talked to Mr. Haberline Fred, who's famous for his murals throughout the, the state and uh, elsewhere in other states. Um, he had mentioned that he had been asked to do a mural here in town besides the the, the replacement mural from... Yeah, the, well, Anne-Marie Velasquez had the one funded, and he redid the silos. And then the one here at the bus garage... Uh, it, when they got the grant, it belonged to the school. And I personally approached Mr. Bollinger as mayor. Mr. Bollinger was the superintendent at the time about Fred redoing the mural. And whether it was Bollinger or the board, I, I have no clue. Nothing ever happened with it. And then it was sold to my family, full disclosure. Oh, okay. And that's where we're growing our hemp. By we, I mean my brother and my dad. Um, and so they've been doing work on the interior... But the facade is, again, just a matter of funding and available funds. And so they've talked to Anne-Marie, and once the facade is ready to be remodeled, then that grant's already in place and been funded so that he can work on that mural. Um, I've secured at least three walls for murals as mayor, and we've gotten four new murals, if I'm counting correctly, during the four years that we've been here. One of them was a replacement mural. There's the one on Chavez Market. Uh, yeah. okay. and uh, well I shouldn't say new there's the refurbishment of the what people call the dragon's den and the refurbishment of the silos 
All those were through Anne Marie's grants, Anne Marie Velasquez. And then the, the Chavez market, I think, was privately funded. And I think Mr. Haberlein donated the replacement of the Vita and the Guadalupe one. So those are four new murals. But I'd like to see more. Right? Would you like to let other town members do it? Because I know that there was a commotion about this wall here having some unpleasant to some people artwork. Yeah, and that's why it was painted over. Okay. And that was, a, that was an initiative that we undertook. And the artwork that was presented to the town was good artwork. And then when he went and he painted on the wall, it was like... What the heck happened there? So that lasted two or three weeks, maybe a month at the most, before we painted over it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it would have to be collaborative. It would have to be a more professional artist. No doubt. Okay. Most important challenges facing the community, uh, job growth, opiate crisis. Uh, right now, uh, those are the two big ones, in my opinion. And we need to... No one board, no one individual can tackle those. It has to be a community thing. And uh, given the opportunity, I'd be willing to lead those. And I've, I've done my best to lead those in other capacities. Um, just a matter of, uh, you know, these big, humongous projects seem to gobble up so much of our time and energy, which is unfortunate. Which one should I skip to now? Um, I guess the partnership one, number 61. Where does public safety rank in your list of priorities? Or what it's paramount. Uh, what kind of partnerships? Well, I mentioned the intergovernmental intergovernmental agreements with the commissioners. Um, I tried to call the previous sheriff on numerous occasions to see if they could start instituting town warrants and taking our town warrants. And uh, the, this is true. I called ten times. I went to the commissioners. Me and the magistrate went to the commissioners. Uh, so just getting a better working relationship with the sheriff's office is important on so many levels. Absolutely, let's do that. Um, what kind of partnerships? Well, I mean, we're already partnering with DOLA for funding. We're already partnering with the State Revolving Fund for funding. We just got funding through USDA. Let's continue those partnerships for other projects. Uh, we've already established a good rapport and good relationship. They've seen what we can do. And because of our past successes, we have that door wide open to us now. Let's continue with Department of Local Affairs, USDA, with state revolving funds so we can get other things done. That's where most of our funding, most of it grant, by the way, has come from. It's from those three agencies. Um, so, yeah, those are good partnerships. Fire and police rank very high. The fire is a district. That's not a town thing, right? That's a fire district. Uh, police is an important issue, but I think we've made major improvements there despite the concerns that two of the officers are married. Um, what are your thoughts on improving the school district and how would you build a positive working relationship with the school district? Um, people view me as antagonistic to the school district because my wife and I started our own school. Uh, oh, the homeschool consortium. Yeah, homeschool consortium. Um, this board has never refused the school. Um, I think the relationship with any school is paramount to a community's success and vibrancy because the youth are the source of that vibrancy. They're the source of hope, not the adults, necessarily. Is the property where South Canada School or Guadalupe Elementary used to be a uh, county still, or is it town? We asked them to annex in, but they haven't. Okay. It's, it's county. Um, they've asked for water from the town for the new baseball field. And had they asked a few months earlier, it could have been done much cheaper. But now that we have new concrete there, uh, not new concrete, new asphalt, excuse me, the, the cost is going to be expensive. It's, it's going to be not all because of the... The total cost is going to be expensive, but for the new taps and everything, you know, um, but we're willing to supply that. And if they go on the other road, uh, County Road 13, I think it is, uh, then they have to work with the county. Either way, they're going to have to work with a different agency to get water to that field. Okay. Uh, but the water is going to be supplied by the town either way, because both of those lines are ours. But which road they cut across is who they have to work with. Okay. Um, I'm always willing to work with kids in the school. Uh, people viewed me as adversarial and... If anybody, uh, if I've had disagreements, it's with the school board. That's the truth. I still say hello to them. I'm still cordial and sometimes even friendly with them. I'm willing to work with anyone. That's the truth. And if people don't believe that, try me. Did I'm, you want to touch base for this interview? And if not, we understand because it wasn't yeah. previously discussed, but, uh, um, and it is personal for your family. But what was the reason for starting? Well, it's always been a dream, okay, first of all. Um, we had pursued uh, the school about 12, 13 years ago. We approached the Diocese of Pueblo about starting a Catholic school. 
And this was during the downturn in the economy when everybody was going belly up and Catholic schools were not immune to that. And they sent down some representatives from the diocese in Pueblo. They talked with uh, Father Sergio, my wife, myself, a community member from Manassa. And I think there was a fifth person involved. I can't, uh, there, but there was four for certain. Anyway, the representative, they dissuaded us. They said, you know, the Catholic school model, it's going belly up, the economy's in the tank, and all that was true. And we were very much dissuaded. Uh, so this last year, when the school board elected to go with one principal instead of two, uh, my wife and I made the effort, uh, the decision, that we wanted to homeschool our daughter. And then, well, can you homeschool the, our, our niece too? And then we had other families, and this is true, God's honest truth, hand to God on Easter no less. Uh, we had families approach us that didn't want to go to a neighboring district but didn't want to leave their community. So we thought, well, again, hearing all these different opinions, how can we make this happen? How can we keep the kids in the community? Initially, we were just going to homeschool my niece and my daughter. And then before you know it, we had seven. So we looked into homeschools and homeschool consortiums, and we thought that was the most obvious way to go. So we approached the church, the parish council, the finance committee. It was almost a unanimous vote from the parish council and the finance committee. One person abstained. Nobody voted against it. And we were allowed to use the religious head center. So we rent that uh, from, the, from the parish. Father Felix. The, the yeah, the Catholic Father Felix. Uh, then we had eight students. And then we had 10. And then we had 13. And then we lost a student. Now we're at 12. Uh, it was never, and, I, and again, I, people are going to say I'm lying, but it's not. We never intended to hurt the school. We intended to keep those kids in their community. Uh, if, if homeschooling our own daughter was hurting the school, and that was the only intent we ever had, was to homeschool our own daughter. I don't understand where the hurt of the child well, they, comes in if they're getting an education. That they're well, people are claiming that we did it out of malice, as retribution for my wife losing her, her employment through the school. Okay, well, you ignore that, so yeah. that's, I guess, I Yeah, because Michelle was the principal. There was two principals. The board elected to go with one principal because of the size of the district, okay. which left Michelle on the outside looking in. She has a job. She works at Adams State. And it was always our dream. Like I said, we had been pursuing it for 12 years. We just always had jobs. And then when this came up, she was unemployed when we started it. I'm like, okay, well, you're unemployed. Let's, let's finally pursue our dream. I'm glad you explained that because for me, you, you hear a lot of things. Well, for us, I should say, is that new news? But for me personally, hearing a lot of things from citizens, there's, you know, like we talked about earlier, the gossip, the rumors that are taken as fact. And that was one of the rumors that we had heard is that Michelle had your wife, excuse me, had a, had a disagreement, um, not by her choosing. Um, no, she applied for the job, she and, didn't get it. And, and was left. So the community has asked us about that. We Honestly, when we don't know, we say that we don't know. But uh, that, that's good that you touched it. And uh, so they should come and ask us. We're, 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 I mean, anybody that's coming to ask about the school, we've talked about it. We're proud of it. I mean, we took eight kids to science fair, seven of them crossed the stage. No other school had 87% of their kids crossing the stage. We had 87% cross the stage. Uh, we believe in justice education. Uh, we believe in taking a community and making it vibrant social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. We believe in empowering kids so that they don't see Exodus as the means of success, that they see their community as a place where they can succeed and thrive. And this is not a condemnation of this district or the districts up the road. We just wanted our daughter to be homeschooled and then it was our niece, like I said, and then other students and parents started asking us. We recruited no one. That's the truth. And now people are still coming to us because parents like us. And uh, so we may grow, but it's not out of malice. If anybody's defended Antonito School District, you read any of my poems, you read any of my letters, you ask any of my former football players, if anybody's defended Antonito School District, Granted, there's several people that have, but I have, and my wife have. My family and Michelle's family, we bleed blue and gold and have always bled blue and gold. We just wanted to homeschool our daughter, and that's where it grew from, because it was a previous dream that now we could make happen.
and that's how it happened. Well, thanks for touching base on that. I guess yeah. that helped me understand too. So yeah, I appreciate that. Is there a list of accountability for items within the mansion since purchase? How do you plan on determining or approving the residents that no items have been misused, similar to the missing stone questions above? Though this one is general and did mention the patio area, which appears to be torn down. Are salvageable parts available to the residents of Antonita for cost free or, free well, or auction? Free or auction. The, the patio was very little was salvageable, maybe the tin, and I don't even, uh, that's a big maybe because it's full of holes now. Rusty nails, rotted out boards. It was leaking bad because of the capillary action. And it was damaging the actual mansion. Plus, it was hindering us from pursuing grants. Say as a, a maker who wants to make things just out of whatever, even considered folk art, you know, you find something and just create something. Yeah, people want to use found art. I mean, if, if that's never been brought to our attention. If, if, if somebody comes to the board and says, hey, we want to uh, recycle or reuse the, the tin from the patio, come ask us. Come get it. As long as the board approves it, come get it. Okay. If you can't come get it, maybe you pay us some mileage and we deliver it to your, we put it in the dump truck, we take it to you. Maybe we want to get it off our hands and we give it to you for free. Okay. But just, it's just a matter of asking. Absolutely. I mean, um, the adobes and the tiles, we had a local resident who was not happy with the stuff there. She thought it was bringing down her property value, so we moved it. Uh, but I'm 99% I'm sure that most of those tiles were the broken and the ones that were leaking. How would you go about obtaining income from the pot industry to help on through the... I mean, we already are. We collect 4% sales tax um, on number 60. Yeah, the pot industry, we already collected 128 from the state, and then we get our 4% sales tax. And they get the industry gets audited all the time, as does the town. Favorable audits, by the way. Uh, 63, we just talked about that one, right? Right. Uh, 64... Will you allow Antonita News with Antonita Police's cooperation to an ongoing weekly list of criminals? Absolutely. And you had discussed that with Chief Taylor previously, we which did. I agreed to. Um, again, it has to go to the board, but I don't see that anybody would object to that. Why not? People have a right to know what's happening in their community. I mean, that's, I mean, we're not a university, but that's the basis for the Cleary Act. That people know what's happening in their community crime-wise. Um, would you be hiring former criminals under your term if elected? How would I know they're former criminals? I think this question was brought up into the uh, the incident where the officer who was employed by Aunt Nito, I think, oh. Nito, stole money from a family, a deceased family member, was later caught and then later employed after community service with Aunt Nito. Yeah. From uh, sentencing, was later employed by the town. And then subsequently let go. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't follow up on it. So, anyway, the person in question was a post-certified officer, and in that capacity, violated uh, their sworn oath and lost their job. And then later reapplied to be a garbage truck driver and was hired as a garbage truck driver, not as a police officer. And was subsequently uh, mutually let go from the garbage position, um, mostly because this person didn't like the job, but also because it just wasn't working for the town. Um, now, full disclosure, when that person was hired as a garbage truck operator, not as a police officer, had, they had not been convicted. Okay. They had only been charged and pled not guilty. And uh, never ever assumed a position as an officer again because that person lost post certification and again I don't mean to be glib about this answer and this is not a, a knock on anybody that collects garbage that's not my point but that's a second chance job in my opinion now if we'd hired him as an officer then by all means that's no good did I answer your question there? You did, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, that person pled out, and because of their plead, uh, plea deal, excuse me, uh, again, I wasn't at this trial, so I can't, I'm only going from hearsay here. Uh, they didn't disqualify that, disqualify that person from being a garbage truck driver. That makes sense. Uh, and 
Would we ever hire former criminals to handle money? No. Would we ever hire former criminals to do law enforcement? No. Would we ever hire former criminals to uh, oversee other employees and uh, potentially be in a supervisory position? No. Uh, would we hire former criminals because they deserve a second chance and they're the only ones that applied for the job? If the board agrees to it, probably. Because it wasn't just me. It was a board decision. And for what it's worth, that particular person was hired when I took office. Not as a police officer, as the garbage. Okay. I didn't hire that person as a garbage. Okay. And if it did, it was right at the right at the interstices of taking office. Okay. Um, um, those are the 66 questions that we had for you and uh, all the other candidates. Um, I can't think of any personally myself that we haven't covered. Yeah, I'm sorry, that you took have... so long, but oh, there's a ton of questions. Yeah, and that's fine. Well, thank you, Mr. Aveda. Thank Mr. you. Mayor. Appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. And thank you for doing it on Easter as well. Yeah. Appreciate that.